that podcast thing presents Home Movie Club, originally recorded May 2018, episode number 25, Clever Girl. Hello and welcome to Home Movie Club, the podcast in which we take an irreverent, and let's face it, sometimes irrelevant look at the highest grossing movies of the last 80 odd years. This time around, we are watching 1993's Jurassic Park, directed by Steven Spielberg, based on a book by Michael Crichton. Joining me on this discovery of dinosaurs and exciting computer systems are Joe Carter. Hi. Daisy Swaffer. Hello. And my darling wife, Sammy Kelsch. Good afternoon. So yes, uh, Jurassic Park, uh, a film I saw at the cinema and I am still struggling to believe is as old as it is and that 1993 was that long ago. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 15 <sighs> Perhaps years. Perhaps I'm just old. Yes. No, uh, 25 years. 25 well, I years. I remember it being on at the cinema. I just chose not to go because I was one of those teenagers. Ah, uh, you see, I was in my second year of university, so <clears throat> yes. I was a student of some age and um, I don't think I saw it until it came out on VHS. The first film I saw in the cinema... But then I saw it a lot. ...that I remember seeing in the cinema was Goldeneye, but I don't remember when that was. Wow. Uh, so, yes, Jurassic Park. Um, let's get some opening thoughts on this film. Uh, let's start with... Daisy, opening thoughts. Um. So, uh, yeah, when I was a teenager, I didn't care for dinosaurs. So I only saw this first way after the hype... And as a result, I kind of, I was one of those teenagers that was like, huh, that's hyped. So obviously I don't want to see that because it's hyped. And I still remember it being like quite or, or awesome <laughs> or striking. I'm not or sure inspiring. Or inspiring. Yes. Or inspiring when I first saw it on the small screen and I really kicked myself for not going to the cinema to see it. Uh, and I think it's aged well. I mean, this is like, what, 25 years old? And it it still looks good. Yeah, I did know a couple of times where I thought the graphics were... Uh, they were showing their age, but they were still very, very good. And, and certainly it, it for the time, they were... It was very pioneering on the graphics for yeah, it as well. For the time, it was yeah. definitely so a breakthrough. I, I think in in the development of film's history, it was quite an important film in that regard as well. So, uh, yeah, this, this was good. And I'm really glad to revisit it now with a more critical eye. <laughs> yeah, it's been a few years since I've seen it, so I, I really enjoyed it as well. Uh, Joe, opening thoughts? Yeah, um, I actually have no idea when I first saw this. I know that I feel like I've seen it a lot, and the second one, and the third one, but that could also just be because I've played the Lego video games <laughs> a lot. Which is why I went, oh, they went because a lawyer wanted a, um, an opinion? I'd forgotten that because that's not in the video game because <laughs> lawyers aren't massively exciting in video games. Um, or, or in real life. But, you know. Or in real life. So, yeah, but so I have no... Oi, actually, no, I wanted to be a lawyer, so shush. Um, so, yeah, I have no idea when I saw it first. I, I'm fairly certain I didn't see it at the cinema. Um, but, yeah, I like this movie. I like Jeff. Jeff is awesome. Um, yeah. I like Ellie. Ellie is awesome. Yep. Um and uh yeah we can talk more about it excellent uh sammy opening thoughts gosh <laughs> i like this movie very much um i i was you know i was still a, a a small school student when it came out um but i I kind of aged out of that age where you're like super into dinosaurs as like a small small person um, but I haven't quite reached, uh, the point where I was just really jaded about everything to the extent that I was like, no. Um, <laughs> so I was, I, I really enjoyed this movie at the time and I think I caught, saw it quite a few times and I haven't seen it in a few years. I think, did we own it on VHS? I feel like we might've owned it on VHS, but, uh, I also, um, 
a frequent earworm when I think of Jurassic Park is the the Weird Al song based on Jurassic Park um, that has a claymation video that we watched last night that goes with it. And it's super great, too. And I don't know, it was just a big part of the cultural consciousness, I think, in that uh, sort of the early to mid 90s. And it's just something that I've always really dug. Yeah, I think, as I said, I watched it at the cinema. Um, it was very awe-inspiring. I mean, you know, from where where they were with computer graphics and where they suddenly, this was appearing on the big screen was like, wow. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've always liked this film. Um, I love the music as well. Uh, it's classic John Williams. I really do love the music in this film. It's one of his um, lesser uh, renowned ones as well. When people cite great John Williams film music, Jurassic Park doesn't tend to get named, but it's brilliant. Really? And it really think, adds so much to the film. Personally, I would put this one higher than um, the, the Indiana Jones soundtracks. I would say, you know, this is one of his best. Um, but no, I mean, just it, it, as you said, it adds so much to the film. Um, and I would, I would slash do quite happily listen to this soundtrack. Just listen to the soundtrack. Mm. Um, I think it's brilliant. Can I, uh, can I drop in a fun fact about the score? Um, yes, of course. Yeah. Yay! Fun fact. Uh, John Williams obviously uh, scored this film, uh, and he did so at the end of February 1993. Um, recorded it just a month later. Man's a powerhouse. Um, and his quote about uh, about it is that he felt he needed to write pieces that would convey a sense of awe and fascination, given it dealt with the overwhelming happiness and excitement that would emerge from seeing live dinosaurs. And I really do feel that he did capture that. Aww. Yeah, so there's nice. nothing like the happiness of seeing a live dinosaur eat you. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's, that's the downside of seeing a live dinosaur, really, Quite. isn't it? The danger yes. of being eaten. I mean, this is the one conceit with this film is that this was never going to be a good idea. No, it's <laughs> yeah. a terrible idea. It's <laughs> and the park itself is bad. just... <laughs> well, I, I think that, that, that Jeff's character, who's... i sorry, I, I only think of him as Jeff. He doesn't have any other names. For once, Dr. I remember his Dr. name Malcolm. was Dr. Ian Malcolm. Dr. Ian Malcolm. I think he summed it up with, with, his, with his very quotable line. Um, we didn't stop to think whether we should yeah. yeah 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 no absolutely i think i think he very much establishes himself early on as sort of the voice of uh, sensibleness <laughs> in in this movie in terms of his attitude to the whole thing let's uh let's make a start so um yeah jurassic park the story begins on Isla nubla a small fictional island 120 miles off the coast of costa rica a large group of construction workers and animal handlers are offloading a large container, although the creature inside the container is unseen. And I, this is a—I always think this is a great opening because it's a—it's a classic misdirect. Because you think trees moving, ominous rumblings, it's going to be a dinosaur, mm. and, and then, then it's not. And then it is literally just a forklift truck and a crate. I mean, mm -hmm. there's something in the crate, but the initial shot is just a forklift truck and a crate. And I think that's brilliant. Um, mm. It's it's not necessarily original, and it's been done before, but I still think it's a really good shot. During the unloading process, uh, the animal attempts to escape, uh, an act which leads to mass panic and the death of one of the workers, which is the first sign that this park is not necessarily the best organised in the world. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> because the, the problem was that to do this, you had to get someone to stand on top of the box to pull the lid up. Oh, boy, yeah. At which point did they not think, let's just get a rope and a pulley system and do it safely from the side of the crate so I'm not standing on this thing with a well, dangerous I think, animal I inside. I think that point that, that you're referring to is probably after this happened. <laughs> At that point, so. they thought it would be a good idea if we get a rope and a pulley system here instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once they're getting sued for a lot of money by the family <laughs> of the poor dead guy. Yeah, so uh, the whatever it is, is I... It, it, I'm guessing inside is a raptor, but it's um, it's the the like the alpha female raptor that gets referred uh, referred to later on. Yeah, um, it's not overly clear, and there's always there's also the thing that when the um, the gatekeeper is actually eaten or attacked 
sort of the the tack is inconsistent with what we then see later with the Raptors, but you know, visually it's quite exciting and I guess that's what we're going for on an opening shot. Sets us up straight away. These dinosaurs are very terrifying to humans. Yeah. Without even seeing a dinosaur, things. we already understand the dangers that mm-hmm. come with this and and the size, you know, yeah, it's impressive. I mean there's only one thing that was more terrifying in this opening scene and that was the mullet slash mustache mm-hmm. combination of one of the workers. Uh, but this was the 90s. It's really so. something special, that's for sure. I yeah. tell you what I was kind of hope no, hoping is the wrong word. Expecting to happen <laughs> is um, the dude being pulled back and only having half a leg or something, because that happens a lot in movies. And I'm kind of glad that they didn't do that, because I think that would have been a little gruesome for the opening. Well, James yeah. Cameron was one of the people who wanted to make this movie, and he said that if he'd have done it, he'd have done it much more gory. Uh, essentially aliens with dinosaurs. So I imagine if he was doing it, he would have shown us the half a body being pulled out there. And then we'd also have had two hours of of pointless 3D and Lord knows what else. So (laughs) not a James Cameron fan. Mm. Listeners to this podcast will know this. (laughs) Story jumps forward to an amber mine in the Dominican Republic. We learn that the death of the worker on the island has raised some serious concerns about the safety of the island. No kidding. Uh Um, And this comes according to lawyer Donald Gennaro, who is played by Martin Ferrero. Not Roche. Uh, To assure the investors, the owner of the park, John Hammond, is now seeking top scientific experts in the field to help endorse the park. Which is odd, because, I mean, the basic principle of this is this is a park where dinosaurs are roaming. Spoilers. No one is an expert on live dinosaurs. That's kind of the whole point. Not live dinosaurs, yeah. no, but... The investors yeah. don't care what they're an expert in. They just want to know some experts have signed off, right? Yeah, experts, true. they've signed off. Great. That's all. Yeah. Gennaro is disappointed to have travelled all the way to the Dominican Republic only to find that the man he has come all this way to see, John Hammond, isn't even there as he's gone home to be with his daughter, who's going through a messy divorce. Mm -hmm. Which is a a little bit of a throwaway line, but does then also set up why the kids are there later. I totally forgot that as to why the kids were there, because I wondered why they were there and why the parents didn't seem worried about them with all these live dinosaurs. Yeah, because they're busy getting divorced and therefore don't have time to think about their children's safety. And also, obviously, this is not um, a particularly poor family, so... You know, they're probably off travelling all the while anyway. Yes. While he speaks to the man in charge of the mine, the miners find a large chunk of amber with a preserved mosquito inside. Uh, and this is important. Uh, Gennaro wants to get Dr. Alan Grant to sign off on the park. But the mine leader warns that it will never get Grant out of Montaya because, like him, Grant is a digger. Montana. Was that what did I say? Were? Oh, it sounded like Montoya, but I no, Montana. it was more of the. They were in Montana. For some reason, it looked like the Gobi Desert or something. <laughs> there was no, a lot of sand. Monta- <laughs> the badlands I mean, of Montana. I mean, they weren't. They were just outside of California, but that's yeah. not the point. But um, yeah. Um, I, I this again. This is one of those shots that it just seems classic Spielberg. Mm. Um, but I wonder if that's just because it's sort of jungle esque, and so therefore seems very reminiscent mm-hmm. of Indiana Jones. But just watching yeah, it, it I was be. thinking that does seem classic Spielberg, especially the zoom on the zoom in on the amber encased and mosquito at the end of the shot. I yes. just thought that was very, <laughs> very Senor Spielberg. Oh yeah. Yep, definitely. At a paleontological excavation in Montana, we introduced a Dr. Alan Grant, played by Sam Neill, and Yay. his partner, Dr. Ellie Sattler, played by Laura Dern. Fun Yay. fact: Alan yeah. Grant is modelled after the paleontologist Jack Horner. Who um, was sitting in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> who is who not was te- related to the composer. <laughs> it was a technical advisor on the film. Mm. But did he sit in the corner? He did. And watched. Rumours are that he did, yeah. Mm. Wow. Uh, we see as they slowly uncover the fossilised remains of a dinosaur. This is a velociraptor, or at least a Jurassic Park velociraptor. Yes. Because mm-hmm. in real life, raptors were roughly the size of a turkey. Well, um, except for the fact that because uh, Spielberg wanted them to be like ten feet tall, so that's how they did them. Um, but just before the film was released, then uh, there was a about ten feet tall uh, Velociraptor skeleton. Well, uh, not quite Velociraptor, a Raptor skeleton discovered in Utah. So they named it the Utah Raptor. 
Mm. Um, so oh. yeah, they they made them ten feet tall, and then they discovered them ten feet tall. <gasps> or did they? Was this a plan? But, ve- <laughs> but the Velociraptor itself was, yeah, not. <laughs> Not the size that we got in this film. No, but it's like the kids say, it's just an angry turkey. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Part of Grant's research involves experiments with a new radiological device that shoots a sound wave into the dirt via a shotgun cell, shell, which then bounces an image of whatever is under the ground back to the receptors on the device. In this case, an uncovered raptor skeleton that is displayed on a computer screen. I love this. This is so... Fake. The tech but it handily allowed cringe. for some exposition to explain to us about the raptors. Yeah, this uh-huh. is so movie science that's just unbelievable. <laughs> so the random kids who he's uh, scaring with the information about the raptors there, there's a fan theory that yes. that kid oh, yes. is Owen Grady from Jurassic World. I mean, it's a neat fan theory. I mean, obviously it's never been... No, I like it as a fan theory, though. I I think it's quite fun. Yeah, Grant is hesitant about the new technology, but seems fascinated with the idea that it produces images without having to dig. Although, as he says, where's the fun in that? Mm. Quite so. However, he also seems incompatible with the technology. As soon as he touches the screen, the image distorts and then the whole device shuts down. Yeah, I didn't really get that. Is he a wizard? I I don't know. I think it's... I think it's just supposed to be set up that he's not comfortable with technology. I don't know. Well, it doesn't really have any impact on... No, it doesn't, no. I thought it was something to do with vibrations. I'm not sure. Because it's almost as if he's, you know, got electricity charge, sort of static charge in his hand and it's sort of doing that. And these old CRTV, CRT monitors were sort of susceptible to things like that, but... Mm. No, I mean, just has Samuel no did play Merlin in Merlin, so he might he might have some magic skills at this stage that he doesn't realise yet. Possibly. Grant is also a follower of the theory that uh, some dinosaur species went on to evolve into modern birds. Um, one of his assistants has brought his son along, who scoffs at the image on the screen, unimpressed with the fact that it looks like a dead turkey. Uh, this is, as we said, potentially... Um, Owen Grady. No, although it's not. It's, not. it's no a way. nice fan theory, though. It's a nice it's... fan theory. The, the boy uh, never gets a name in the script or in the film, so it it's anybody, to be honest. Um, however, as you said, this is this this is the exposition point where we get sort of the description of how Velociraptors hunt their prey using fast coordinated attacks uh, and their sort of sharp sickle like toe on their their feet. So yeah, it, it kind of the whole scene exists pretty much to explain that Velociraptors are not to be messed with. Because we didn't already know that. Well, I didn't in 1993. No, I mean we didn't in 93 because, as I said, these things weren't real. These were, you know, at this point, these these weren't the cultural sort of touchstone they are now. Yeah, I'd never heard of a Velociraptor before Jurassic Park. I no. learned so much about dinosaurs because of this movie, kind of. Um, again, this is this is another place where the music is sort of it's almost the music's reminiscent of Indiana Jones, but um, yeah, and I, and they say the whole thing of Grant being machine incompatible. I I I don't really get it, other than possibly hammering home the fact that he's sort of old school luddite. Mm. <laughs> Not necessarily luddite because he's he's entertaining the idea of the the technology, but yeah, I mean, there's another scene later on in the helicopter which again makes no sense at all. Uh, with a seatbelt. That was just ridiculous. Ah, uh, I've got a, we'll get I've to got that an explanation for that. Yeah, again, it doesn't really sort of do anything other than set the character up. And I guess that's possibly what it needs to do. Yeah. Um, one thing that did annoy me is the fact that when he said yeah. that he thought dinosaurs might evolve into birds, the rest of the uh, sort of gathered archaeologists laughed. Sorry, paleontologists laughed. Yeah. And, you know, this is 1993, so... But the theory hadn't, you know, the theory wasn't unreasonable at that time. No, it, was it was a theory, Jack Horner, who was people our... People still um... don't want to believe that dinosaurs had feathers. No, but that's because people also don't want to believe the Earth is round and that, you know, we evolved from monkeys, so... Yeah. Uh, but Jack Horner true. was very much a proponent of the dinosaurs to birds theory. Uh, yeah. It's possible why this came into it, but... Yeah, I just, it was a bit weird that it got the laugh it did from the assembled archaeologists, where they're all scientists and they're all like... They can't deny this as a possibility. Mm-hmm. You can deny anything if you try hard enough. I don't, yeah. I don't think this you shouldn't film be digging necessi- up dinosaurs. I don't think this film necessarily gives an accurate portrayal of scientists in general, though. No. 
Oh, indeed, computer scientists. No, yeah. Oh my god, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, I, I we will get we're started. I have some words about that later on. <laughs> Uh, the dig is cut short by a sudden, noisy, and potentially destructive appearance of a helicopter belonging to Grant and Sattler's main sponsor, the elderly and eccentric billionaire John Hammond, who is played. Practically lands the... on the freaking dinosaur skeleton. I mean, dude. The the rather lovely Richard Attenborough. Um, yeah, it's, it's like, but then he knows what we don't know at this point, which is that there's no point digging up dinosaurs because, well, we've got some in a park over there. And then for this one scene only. He's Scottish. He's very Scottish. And then he's, he doesn't have a Scottish accent again after that. But for this one scene, he's Scottish. <laughs> I'm like, did he forget this? Except for another scene where halfway through the scene, he becomes Scottish again. Yeah. It's just bizarre. Although accents change over time. I mean, yeah, not but within the space with of a film. Space or mythy, of like but... a week. Yeah. yeah. He's intermittently Scottish. I'll yeah. buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Hammond invites them over to endorse his latest project, a remote island resort where he claims that there are unique biological attractions that are guaranteed to drive children out of their minds. Mm-hmm. Or to their deaths. Or to their yeah. deaths. Ellie and Alan are reluctant to leave their dig, but Hammond entices them by offering to fully fund their dig site for a further three more years. Which is a big which, deal. When you... Bearing in mind what he has on the island seems a bit of an empty promise because their dig site is going to become irrelevant fairly quickly. Yeah, and after the end of this movie, uh, did they get that funding for continuing their dig or not? I want to know. Questions I would assume yes, not on the grounds question. that you know the park wasn't endorsed so the lenders and the bank would shut them down. So, so. he left his dig site and all this and, and then doesn't actually get anything in payment for his time and his no. life. In fact, if if memory serves from Jurassic Park The Lost World, even if if only in the book, part of that plot is the fact that Hammond is actually forced out of the company and has no money at all. So oh, yeah. Uh, also, John Hammond lets himself into their trailer and steals their champagne, which yeah. whilst he pays, I think it said fifty fifty thousand dollars a year to the dig, which is I think around eighty seven thousand in today's money. It feels like he it's owns not them. That expense. It's not that much money. So it's a bit kind of presumptive of him. Yeah, a little bit. It's quite All the rest of those people left at the dig without these two experts now, carrying on on their merry way, uh, thinking that they've got this funding for three years and then they, they'll find out at some point that no, no, they don't. And perhaps they've all got to pack up and go home now. Yeah. So this, I, I don't like this aspect of it. And it also yeah. slightly was the way that when the helicopter came, which obviously lots of destructive winds and downdrafts yeah. and that, uh, they were scrabbling to cover the the sort of site over. But I'm sure they must get windstorms in that area anyway. So they've got to be vaguely prepared for that sort of thing. Well, yes, but they I'm assuming they have meteorological, meteor, meteorological <laughs> um, sensors to yeah. tell them if there's a sandstorm coming so they can prepare. They don't have a sensor for idiots in helicopters. True. I think we should all have an idiots and helicopters sensor. I'd like an idiot sensor. Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah. Keeps going off every time I look in the mirror. I don't know why. Oh. We shift over to San Jose in Costa Rica, where we see a white tourist carrying two heavy looking bags climb out of a cab and start looking for someone in a rural market square. A corpulent man sitting on an outdoor table eating sees the new arrival and calls him over. Dodgson is annoyed. Dodgson is annoyed that Dennis Nedry uses his real name, but Nedry continues to shout out the name just to prove that no one cares. <laughs> yeah, that's just really, it was like unnecessary, dude. This, this has become yeah. a bit of a, a fan thing now as well, apparently. People have like t shirts with Dodgson written on it and, and oh, with the picture dear. of the dude. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> Dodgson and Nedry discuss payments of getting viable embryos off the island. And Dodgson gives Nedry a can of shaving foam that has a secret compartment at the bottom that will keep the embryos alive for up to 36 hours. Oh, no, man. Nedry, Nedry squeals in childish delight at this little James Bond gadget, mm-hmm. but it becomes serious when telling Dodgson that he needs to ensure the boat is ready and waiting for him when he steals the embryos. I think that's possibly one of the most realistic things in this movie is his reaction to this gadget. Because yeah. I would have been like that too. Yeah. Although yeah. I wouldn't have smooshed the, the shaving cream on someone else's dessert. No, no that's that disgusting. Was just... But you're not Newman. Yeah, right. exactly. You're, a, you're yeah. a good person, yeah. basically. Nedry is obviously greedy for money and 
you know, you, you you can question his motives. He has no morals. He has no morals, but equally, I'm not sure he's specifically the bad guy in this film. He's the catalyst that kicks everything off, but I don't know. I mean... He's not a good guy, put it that he's way. He's not a good guy, but also he's just the programmer. He's not the one who decided to clone all the dinosaurs and, you know... No, but he decided to take advantage of it for profit. Hmm... But he's not the villain who's out to get the good guys per se. He's 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 a guy who has a bad plan, whose plan, you know, goes a bit screwy, and as a result of a not nice person's plan going a bit screwy, everyone else gets a bit screwed. But ultimately I think the villain of the piece is hubris. I also love how Dodge annoys the local cabbie by not closing the door when he gets out of the cab. So he gets out of the cab, walks off, and the cabbie has to come around. <sighs> Close the door and then makes a rude gesture towards him oh, as he I didn't walks away. That. That I hadn't noticed know first around, but watching it again part. last night, I did pick it up. But yeah, um, I would call him more immoral than evil. Yeah. Yeah. We see a helicopter flying low over the ocean in Gen Logo, stenciled on its side. John Hammond, Dr. Alan Grant, Dr. Ellie Statler, accompanied by two other characters. An eccentric, chaotic, uh, an eccentric chaos theory, Dr. Ian Markham, played by Jeff. Jeff Yay! Goldblum. And the yeah, lawyer Donald Gennaro, who are here, who is here to represent Hammond's investors. Uh, can I express fine. an unpopular opinion here? <gasps> yeah. Not. Only what? if it's not about Jeff. What was the point of Jeff Goldblum? <gasps> Excuse you. I think to an extent he was supposed to be the the um. Jamsel the voice of reason, maybe. <laughs> he didn't do anything. He's he had nothing of... relevant to the plot at all. He didn't have any science that we needed to know. I didn't see any need for his character at all. He... He's the voice of reason. He's extremely sexy. The Chaos, voice of reason you know. was irrelevant. He basically yeah, predicted nice. all the events in the film. But he, yeah, but again, that not, wasn't not really chaos theory. That was just common sense. Yeah, and not not necessary for his character to do that. That anyone yeah. could have done that. I don't know. I mean, he is a, he is definitely a character, and I think my notes for this just literally says Jeff is very Jeff. He's extremely <laughs> Jeff, and he's so. wonderful. I mean, I enjoyed his character, but I just didn't see the point of his character. What is the point no. of any character? What is the point of any movie? Why do we? Well, the others, yeah, what, the what, others what contributed the the to the plot. There, except to be kids. He 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 didn't contribute to the plot. Yes, he did. Well, did the kids contribute to the plot? Yes. Yes. I mean, what? you're right. It's an unpopular opinion, but I do kind of see where you're coming from, Daisy. No, <laughs> I don't you're like wrong. it. I don't like it. I'm sorry. I do. I I'm, I'm I haven't had a. You know, if I sit down with the text for like a couple of hours, I can write you a long ass essay about why he's very, very, very important as a figure in this movie. But honestly, at this stage, I haven't had the chance to do that. (laughs) But he's great. okay? (laughs) I'm not saying he's not great. I'm just questioning his the point of his character at all. So you're basically being Hammond who said, huh, I brought scientists. You brought a celebrity. Yeah, you brought a rock star. And that's very much the case there. Yeah. I mean, Chaos Theory clear, clearly predates the film Jurassic Park. Yeah. But I do also wonder how important Jurassic Park was but to the general popular race. He's a mathematician, popul- isn't he? He's yeah. a chaosist. Chaostician, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he's, he's a, a super intelligent dude. Sometimes, yeah. it's, I, sometimes I think it's useful having the, the point of view of someone there who isn't as invested in the exact science that you're doing so has a bit of perspective he's got perspective that the dinosaur people don't because their whole thing is paleo stuff yeah i mean they get out and have a different viewpoint on it from the outset than the guy who you know isn't super invested in paleo stuff and can see i think in a slightly clearer (laughs) way that I didn't this feel is, that I is, got any different you know, perspective sort of idea. from him than from anyone else. Yeah. I mean, we get we get we get some some you know complaints from the others slightly further on, but I think he's the first one to kind of express misgivings in a meaningful way, and he's also great. I'm not saying he's not so, great. So I just don't see the point of him. I just expressed the point of him. I think quite well. <laughs> I'm very sorry that you don't see that because I'm smart. All right, everybody stop. <laughs> no, Jeff is awesome. Jeff is very important to the plot and all the things that Sammy said and more. <laughs> no, he's not. Well, I anyway. agree to disagree on that then. 
No, no, um, you can just be wrong and Sammy and I are right. I like you, Joe. Yeah, I like you too, Sammy. Thank you. He offers nothing to this plot. Anyway. Stop. Stop. Obviously, in real life, this is not an island off Costa Rica. Um, most of the external sets for Jurassic Park or even Jurassic Park. Um, That's the one. Were shot mainly in Kauai, Hawaii. Um, and apparently that did indeed suffer a huge hurricane, Hurricane Iniki, during the filming. Uh, and indeed footage of the storm was included in the film as part of uh, the later tropical storm hitting the park. Everyone uh, took shelter for that, except for Richard Attenborough, who uh, slept through the entire thing. He did. And said, he slept through the blitz. This was nothing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the helicopter comes in and flies over the uh, the, the landscape uh, and then begins its descent down to the helipad. Um, once again, we see Grant being incompatible with technology. In this case, the seat, seat belts in the helicopter. But again, demonstrates his practical skills by just tying two ends together. And there's also a theory that this is a foreshadowing as well. Because it... it's, you know, two... Uh, two female parts of the belt, and then he he finds a way to make it work. For yeah, but also wow, that's way deeper than I. Wow. <laughs> yeah. My problem with it was be that if he was doing that, what was Ellie Sattler using to do her um, seat belt with? Because yeah. there's only going to be one male and one female per seat. Yeah, I wouldn't. There was no too. way he would have two female parts unless yeah. he grabbed one of the other seats as. But there was only there was the same number of seats as a number of people in the helicopter. No, there was so a if he grabbed one the one next. next to it, Ellie wouldn't maybe, have had one either. Maybe the other two seatbelt pieces were gay. <laughs> That's not how it works with seatbelts, dear. Are you sure? Yep. Maybe you just haven't met any. Uh, the helicopter lands next to uh, a set of impressive falls, which in real life are called something that I'm not even going to vaguely attempt to pronounce. <laughs> Um, and apparently the rough landings there were not that simulated because apparently it's supposed to be an absolute nightmare descent because of the uh, the drop. Yeah, they had to the... use dummies in the helicopter for the external filming because it was too dangerous, <laughs> really, for the <laughs> actors in there or even the action, uh, what do you call them, stunt people in there. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so they get out of the helicopters and get into Jeeps, which although they have the Jurassic Park logo on the side, which clearly says Jurassic Park, and indeed has a picture of a dinosaur, uh, skeleton, they still seem to be completely oblivious to the nature of the park. I don't, yeah. Well, maybe they think it's some kind of, you know, theme park yeah. with dinosaur skeletons, and that's why they're there to make sure they've been assembled properly and stuff. Possibly. Uh, as they make their way into the park, Hammond and his lawyer, uh, Gennaro, discuss the safety features of the park. As they drive through the park in the Jeeps, they're treated to a unique spectacle of living, breathing dinosaurs. Mm. Just the sight of these mighty beasts, a towering brachiosaurus, accompanied by a herd of Parasaurolophus, is enough to leave the stunned visitors breathless, save for Gennaro's offhand comment that we're going to make a fortune from this place. And we get that beautiful, iconic music yep. as they're watching these dinosaurs. Music swelling in the background. It's really impactful and moving. Uh, the graphics don't necessarily hold up 100% on this shot. The It doesn't look quite as... I don't know, quite as much there as you'd expect nowadays. Uh, but for but it being 25 just years the pure old, raw delight and emotion of the scene clearly holds up. I mean, I, yeah. I was tearing up at it last night. I'll happily admit that. Yeah, we had to have a cuddle. That scene always gets me. The, just the first time you see the dinosaur. Yeah. Just the whole sort of the music swells and then, and then you, you see this dinosaur, dinosaur and everybody's reaction and... is just... And then you move from seeing one dinosaur to like the watering hole and there's loads of them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, on the big screen, that was so, so impressive. Nah. It just proves why they've got Jeff Goldblum there, because he's not an idiot that gets out of the Jeep. No, he sits in the Jeep, but he still is very much clearly moved by it. Yeah. Well, what, what is it that he says that son of a bitch did it? And yeah. then I just really I just really wanted the other guy in, 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 the, uh, in the Jeep, like the driver, to just be like, I did? Yeah, Aww. it's like, you did it. I can't believe the son of a bitch, you actually did it. And the driver turns around and goes, no, I didn't. <laughs> that, wasn't me. that was the dog. That, was, that wasn't me. That was one of the dinosaurs. Yep. And then uh, the, he asks how fast the dinosaurs are, and Hammond casually mentions that they've clocked the T Rex at thirty-two miles an hour, and and nobody really goes what what. Yeah, no one's kind of gone. Okay, well you've got 
Apex Predators then? Because I'm sure that will go well later. Yeah, like, why are they not going, or... Zong, why have you got a T-Rex here? What are you doing? Because no, no one says that. dinosaur fanboys. That's why. Yeah, I mean, the T-Rex is, is sort of the one traditional dinosaur that everybody knows and loves i guess but when you're later kids, on but... it, he's like oh my god you've got velociraptors here oh no and yet wasn't reacting like that to them having a t-rex yeah. there they well, they build the mean... t-rex up as being dangerous but they they build the velociraptors up as being sort of deadly and highly intelligent and you know the worst thing ever well the, the t-rex you know is a formidable predator certainly but can it even change a set of bed sheets well this is true Little tiny arms. If you're ever if you're ever sad, if you're ever just feeling really down, just visualize a T Rex trying to change bed sheets. Later as they arrive at the island central resort and control facility, the visitors are given a brief tour of the process that created the animals. Injin has succeeded in cloning animals from simple strands of DNA salvaged from mosquitoes that feed on dinosaur that fed on dinosaur blood and were preserved for millions of years inside fossilized amber. Uh, so yeah we get this whole sort of show um, that is to an extent DNA cloning for dummies uh, mm. and it's mainly for the audience I think rather than anybody else because nobody else seems to know exactly how cloning works even Dr. Malcolm who's a chaostician but, but they're like oh but the you DNA see, would have talk. gaps and then it goes yeah. on to explain there were gaps but we filled those with frog DNA so it's all fine voila dinosaurs and so we I also didn't get is still, okay John Hammond has lines and has to stand there and interact with this screen that yeah. is himself. Does he do that for every single every, tour? Yeah, exactly. Every single tour. That's, is is this just, just an special, investor's like, thing? or Investor's tour, yeah. Yeah, that was odd because that's surely... <laughs> it does kind of imply that that's his life from now on in, standing there doing this tour. Yeah, I thought like, the oh, exact same thing when job. I saw it. Every 20 minutes for the rest of his life. Yeah. I mean, I love the way that they use the animation here because it is... It's nothing more than a huge sort of exposition dump, but it doesn't really feel like that. And it, yeah. do, it does it in the kind of way that you would expect a thing like that to explain it to you on a you know, theme yeah. park type thing as well. So it, it's very clever in the way it does it. Yeah. Hi, my name's some DNA. Yeah, it's Mr. DNA. Mr. DNA. Uh, so the tour continues, the sort of safety bars come down and they start rotating and then they see the actual lab where the DNA is cloned and where the dinosaurs are first created. And we get the lovely line from the lawyer that asks if this is all autoerotica. <laughs> Which for kids is like, I don't get that. But the adults are like, mm. I did wonder what was with that line. Yes. So no, this is, these are not animatronics. <laughs> these are indeed real people. But also it shows that the park has got issues because they literally just push the bar up and stop the tour mid-going. Yeah, and what all if, just like, get out and walk some away. random tourists decide to do that and start, you know, like going into labs without any, you know, sort of like gloves on and touching stuff. Like, this is a terrible plan. There are several points in this movie where you think this is a terrible theme park. Even if it didn't have dinosaurs, this is a terrible theme park. You know when you do testing on stuff and you test whether or not it does what it's supposed to do and you also test whether or not you can break things and you... Yeah. And and I feel like by putting these scientists there, they were doing the test to see whether people could break things because these scientists are just like, I don't care about the rules and safety bars and things. I'm just going to push them over. I don't care that the Jeep is meant to have us locked in. We're just going to get out and so on. Yeah. So I feel like they were doing an important testing job here. <laughs> Possibly should have done that before the dinosaurs got, you know, out and about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the group makes his way into the egg incubation room just in time to witness the birth of a baby dinosaur. Uh, Dr. Was... Grant asks what species this is and is understandably alarmed when he's told that it's a baby velociraptor. But it's so cute! It was very convenient timing, wasn't it? Yeah. So perfect. Oh, this little face. Dr. Mokum asks how they stop the dinosaurs room. breeding in the park. Dr. Wu, played by B.D. Wong, tells them that they have engineered all the dinosaurs to be female. Uh, so they cannot breed in the wild. You want a, a bet, says Jeff. Uh, Jeff, Jeff, yeah. At this exactly. point, Jeff is like... See, mm. Jeff, nature finds a way. See, important lines, important character. 
Anyone but could have said that. Anyone could have said that. Scientist guy. Anybody could have said anything in the film. Because they, Grant knows about the frogs as well. So yeah, but 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 that Wu guy, you'd think he would have learned from this movie because he he is in the third one. Fourth, yes. No, he comes back for the new series. <laughs> I think yeah. perhaps he thinks that, you know, lessons have been learnt uh, three times already, so mistakes won't be made anymore, and hey, they're going to mm. pay him lots of money for this. Again, perhaps amoral rather than evil. Yeah, as you said, all the scientists are wearing lab coats, and I assume it's a fairly clean room, but the visitors and John Hammond just waltz on in, and it's like, uh, okay, well, I guess this was a clean room. It's now got people wandering from outside. We get the first appearance of Samuel L. Jackson, or at least his voice. I was really thrown by Samuel L. Jackson being in this. Yeah, it's and this is the thing, it wasn't his first hair. film. But I think we just forget how much more recognisable he is today than he was in 93. Yeah. Because uh, he wasn't the star he is now. Eagle-eyed listeners uh, who remember the 90s may remember that Samuel L. Jackson also played Jamal's dad in Ghost Rider. <laughs> Which I did not realize was him until much later when I went to rewatch the ridiculous series on YouTube and was like, oh my god, is that Samuel L. Jackson? But he's all big and famous, but he wasn't really in the early 90s. No, I think Hence the only thing he'd Jamal's done big film wise. Yeah, the only thing he'd done big films before this was uh, the, the sort of the. the sort of Hot Shots type lethal weapon knockoff, which I can't remember what it was called. Uh, which is sort of like him and I think Emilio Estevez or something. Yeah. And this isn't the usual type of role that we see him in now as well. This is like a, a, a geeky engineering type role. He, yeah. he doesn't usually play that kind of character. Yeah. So yeah, I was really thrown. <laughs> mm. Special containment facility, the, the one seen in the introduction, which is a fortress of electrified fences and, and dense foliage is all that separates the humans from the most dangerous creature on the island. The head chef, do you know? No. Um, <laughs> the guests are witness to a daily feeding of the animals. A cow is lowered into the pit, only to be stripped clean within moments. Oh, Cleverly, the without films... showing us any of the yeah, like the, the gore happening, without showing us the dinosaurs, spared, but we still get the impression of them being there yeah. very strongly. Yes, yeah, the film's audience is spared the gruesome sight of the carnage by thick coverage of foliage. The sound design in this is, I think, top class. And the animals consuming the cow is visceral, yet unseen. Also, I love the fact that one would assume that someone's job was there just to sit there and shake the foliage and the oh, ferns absolutely. inside the enclosure. Absolutely. That's the job in Hollywood I want, just to sit and just shake some trees. Well, considering yep. that later on in this, it was someone's job to uh, shake the young girl's uh, arm as she was holding jelly. <laughs> yeah. Literally shook her arm. <laughs> Hi, I'm head shaker. <laughs> yeah, like, like that possibly was someone's primary job, shaking things. Mm. Yeah, the look on the visitors' faces tell a story as well. I mean, it goes from disgust to fascination. Um, and I kind of get the impression the head chef's menu of chili and sea bass may not be wanted. Although, mm. ironically, I'd have said they should have gone for beef, just for the, you know, Irony. humor level. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we then get a quick uh, biology lesson about the raptors from park ranger Robert Muldoon, played by Bob Peck, just to emphasise the deadly nature of these creatures and how clever they are. They learn and remember. Uh, since we've just oh. mentioned Muldoon, uh, the the script for this movie went through quite a lot of different iterations, as any kind of novel-to-film type uh, screenplay does. And, uh, and it, 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 Muldoon and... Uh, Dr. Malcolm were amalgamated just into Muldoon uh, in one of those versions, just to emphasise the fact that Dr. Oi. Malcolm isn't really needed. <laughs> the park ranger says these animals are too dangerous and should be destroyed. The velociraptors are led by a single alpha female who is highly intelligent and has been testing electric fences for weaknesses, but never the same place twice as she learns where things are. Well, yeah, because it's pointless to test the same place twice. Indeed. Uh, visitors then go to lunch. Uh, there is a heated disagreement between Dr. Malcolm and John Hammond about the levels of control possible in a park. Dr. Sattler agrees that things could be better, pointing out that the plants in the visitor centre have been chosen for their looks, but some of them are actually poisonous. Aggressive and poisonous. Show, like, how, how would you not research 
research that before. Yeah. Well, you could assume that the people visiting aren't going to start eating the plants. True, but you've you've yeah, got ch- not. You can't it. assume that if there's children running that's, around. That's you can't assume that if there are children running around because children there are those kids who will attempt to eat anything. Yeah. Maybe they yeah. get told as they come on, "Don't eat the plants." And that just uh, seems that's pointless. just you gonna, gonna, just gonna make me want to eat the plants. Sign a disclaimer. I know. Seriously, it's now it's a forbidden sport. snack. It's even more delicious to me. <laughs> Grant points out that the humans and dinosaurs have been separated <laughs> by millions of years of evolution. But now I've just been thrown back into the mix together. Uh, and so we have no idea what's going to happen. Well, yeah, I think we, we do. do yeah, to be yeah, honest. we really we do. have an inkling. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like yeah. this Hammond is incredulous and points out that the blood sucking lawyer is the only one on his side. The park is apparently opening with just a few of the planned attractions. And I did wonder how much of this was due to budgetary and technical strengths of the film. Because I'm fairly sure in the original book there was a large section involving sort of flying pterosaurs and a river escape and things like that that never made it into the film. And I wonder how much of that was just because technologically that just isn't possible. And Budget and possibly they wanted to... Length of film. Yeah, I was going to say... That also as well, yeah. Avoid, with, with a movie, I think the, 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 the progression of events in this story feels... It's got a good sense of pace. If it was just, you know, sort of like introduce this dinosaur, introduce this other dinosaur, introduce like a fifteenth dinosaur, and all this other stuff, and it's just this happens and this happens and this happens, I, I think it would feel a little bit more sort of like, okay, we get it. There's dinosaurs. Yeah, this was Spielberg, know? not not James Cameron. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly. I think we only saw we saw less than ten separate species through the entire film. It might even be sort of five or six at the most. This might be a good time for a fun fact. Do Fun factors. On. There are only 15 minutes of actual dinosaur footage in the film. Wow. Nine of those minutes are the animatronics and six of those minutes are the Real CGI. Real life dinosaurs. And generally speaking, <laughs> yes, if Joe. it's a full dinosaur shot, it's the CGI. And if it's parts of dinosaurs, it was animatronics. Yeah. Where were the real dinosaurs? Uh, they couldn't oh, afford them. Honey. Damn. Yeah, the ones they got were behind the camera. That's who was doing the shaking of the trees and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. yeah they were production assistants, actually. Yeah. I didn't see them. Velociraptors, the very deadly, but also make really good uh, background artists. Yeah, yep. They provided the sound effects as well for yeah, a lot of foley them. artists. Yeah, yeah T Rex is good at foley. Yep, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, we do see here Doctor Malcolm again is the voice of reason. Yeah, um, reason, Doctor Malcolm, but- voice of reason. Voice of reason. <laughs> so, and you get the line that in turn have made their advances standing on the shoulder of geniuses where their scientists so preoccupied whether they could and not stopping to consider whether they should do this. Which is an awesome line about basically all science and all technology. Yeah. Hammond tries to bring in the recovery of endangered species such as condors, uh, such as condors as a reasonable argument for cloning, but Malcolm points out that they are not talking about a species devastated by human activity. And that dinosaurs had their chance and lost the evolutionary race. Yeah, they got hit by mm. a bloody meteor. I mean, if they couldn't survive that, then, you know. Group, the group prepares to experience the theme park's central attraction, in which visitors embark on a safari-like tour of the park on specialised, electrified Ford Explorers. Doctors Grant, Sattler and Malcolm and Donald Gennaro are accompanied by John Hammond's two grandchildren, Lex and her little brother, Tim. And my note simply says, Yay! kid is <laughs> which is pretty much how grant feels about it as well yeah. yeah but we do at this point we do get the the best line of the film um which is although the cars run on, sorry so the cars have run on drive but as lex gets in she shouts it's an interactive cd rom you touch a part of the screen and it talks about whatever you want that's not the best yeah. line in the film in this it, in, in it, this it, big chunky yeah. crt like box thing as well it sort of dates the film so much, doesn't it? As if an interactive CD-ROM is somehow the highlight and the sort of the... That's the exciting That's thing the pinnacle part. of technology yep. at this point. <laughs> she expresses more excitement about that than dinosaurs. Yeah. Well, in fairness, we do later find out that she's a hacker, so she's super into, like, all... Of course, no, she's yes, a computer she's a hacker. Hacker. Yeah. a hacker. She yeah. knows Unix! Oh my god, she's yes. so dangerous. Yes. As the group heads off, John Hammond settles into the main control room where his two computer experts... Ray Arnold, which, as we said, is played by Samuel L. Jackson, Yay! and Dennis Nedry, played by Wayne Knight, manage the complex infrastructure of the park. And yeah, in this as well, we also get something that dates it, and that Samuel L. Jackson is there in work smoking. 
God, yeah. chain oh my smoking. God. He nurses that cigarette for how many scenes? Yeah. And that fact that he's there smoking almost dates this as much as the old Apple Macintosh computers they're yeah. running their systems yeah. off. Yeah. Really it's like, is. uh. So the tour starts off and they, they sort of, they go through the big gate into the park proper. And obviously at that point, Dr. Malcolm mentions King Kong, which, as we've seen in previous podcasts for watching King Kong, has a very similar stylistic gait to keep the monsters at bay. Yes, it does. And indeed, didn't we see in that making of last night that um, that, that Fay Ray paid a visit? She did indeed. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah. The tour starts and is largely dull and uneventful, when neither the Dilophosaurus or the Tyrannosaurus Rex, two extremely dangerous carnivores, we're told, reveal themselves to the Egotaurus even after the T-Rex is baited with a tethered goat. It really is just like a, a, a Tuesday at African Lion Safari at this stage. Yeah, um, no one's showing up at all. Uh, this was also where we get the awesome line with God creates dinosaurs, God destroys dinosaurs, God creates man, man destroys God, man creates dinosaurs, dinosaurs, dinosaurs eat man, and women inherit women the, the world. Yeah. Uh, we also get the uh, Richard... Keel sort of narration telling us that one of the earliest predators we now know that Dilophosaurus is poisonous and spits its venom at its, at its prey causing blindness and paralysis Ooh, foreshadowing. which foreshadowing. comes up later but I also love the fact that it says we now know that this happened yeah. which makes you've yeah. got to feel sorry for the first park worker who got this done to him mm. yeah it's like we found out when one of our park workers was blinded that's the implication, isn't it? Is that we now know because this happened to somebody. Would you like a fun fact about this particular dinosaur? Mm. The Dilophosaurus, yes, yeah. please. So the venom spitting thing and the, the poofy neck frill that we see later on as well. Um, they're, they're like the memorable things about this dinosaur, right? Mm-hmm. So whenever... Uh, I, I keep saying this dinosaur because I can't pronounce it. Uh, whenever this dinosaur... it's easy. Yes, that. Whenever this dinosaur gets used for, like, toys and it, it references and stuff, it, it's always using one or other of those aspects or, or both, when actually neither of those are things that are known about the dinosaur and the things that actually make it um, distinctive are the twin crests on its head and the thin jaws, and you can't even really tell those about it in this film no. but our, our kind of uh, general consciousness of what this dinosaur looks like now is the jurassic park version because that's just yeah. how how much of an impression it's made on um, wow. on our culture in general i mean this is the other thing is we don't see this dinosaur at all at this point which obviously this comes up later with with nedry but you know at this point we have no idea what this dinosaur looks like and it could be 300 foot tall for we you know mm. It's it's being we are being told it's a deadly predator and it spits out spits acid and you know yeah I was expecting it to and... be you know Diplodocus kind of size yeah mm. so when we Dippy. sort of see I it later Dippy. it's more of a it's tiny it's like a angry chicken yeah, yeah. I think it's slightly bigger than that but yeah it's not much bigger than that uh, at this point we get Ray pointing out another glitch on the system and says that they have issues both but both the issues of both theme parks and zoos. Um, which is fair enough, although generally they also have dinosaurs, so that's got to help. Yeah. Um, Hammond blames Nedry, who just laughs it off and points out that actually in many ways Hammond does spare expenses because apparently he was being cheap. So Hammond's line, oh, spared no expense, seems sort of hollow at this point. Oh, yeah, no. but Nedry's also like, oh, I'm the only person that can read these 200,000 lines of code, and I'm just thinking... Dude, so full Two of Two million yourself. lines of code. He's yeah. so arrogant. Yeah. He really, I mean, can you imagine working with him? Uh. Oh, I've worked with him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hate to say it, but so have I. So, yeah. you know. yeah. um, there's a, a nice little Easter egg in this scene. Um, if you look at Nedry's uh, computer screen, uh, then you can see there's a little window and it's got uh, Jaws playing on it which, of course, was a Steven Spielberg movie (laughs) in which he used animatronic animals. Animal. animal. (laughs) Uh, They get to the T-Rex paddock, which is... Yeah, the T-Rex paddock annoys me as well. Um, Two reasons. Reason... I have some beef with this film. I love this film, but I do have (laughs) beef with it. Uh, Reason it beefs me, one, is 
later on we see a huge drop on the side of the paddock that just doesn't seem to be there at this point yeah yeah uh, and thing two this is the t-rex okay this is the biggest draw probably in the entire park it's the best known dinosaur it's the one everybody wants to see why is it the second one on the tour yes why not save that till last Mm, that's a good start point. with some smaller sort of veggie dinosaurs and then work your way up to the t-rex i think perhaps they should consult you about their next park design mm. yeah absolutely we should get this should sponsored by jurassic input. world evolution yeah. and get them to do it yeah <laughs> yeah you're right that is terrible park design other than obviously the bad park design <laughs> yeah and then there's Quite also the, the issue park design is bad park design yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's also the whole thing of the, the, the track there on seems to be both ways. But um, yes, it, it is at this point, as you say, we get the lovely line that uh, women inheriting the earth, which I think is quite right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and we also get goat feeding time. And Lex is shocked by the idea that a T-Rex might eat a goat. And because then, she's vegetarian. Because she's vegetarian. Yeah, she's, it's like, but, but, oh, honey, you're not going to be one of those people who grows up to try and make her cat vegan, are you? Yeah. And also, we also get another lesson from Malcolm about chaos theory and flirting. Thank um, you. As I, said, I did wonder whether Jurassic Park had a vast impact on the cultural significance or the cultural knowledge of what chaos theory really was. Because mm. I think in 1993, most people wouldn't have a clue what chaos theory was. And I think this, this was a flawed but basic understanding comes from, you know, from Jurassic Park. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, as the tour continues, the group spots a sick triceratops near the, on a nearby hill, being tended by the park veterinarians. Once again, a fundamental and basic flaw with the park is displayed when Dr. Grant just opens an unlocked door of the Ford Explorer and jumps out of the moving he vehicle. Just, he just gets out and runs out into the... Did they not think that un, unruly children with like bad parents... We do, yeah. we do see do them later going, same. oh yeah, we should make it so that we can lock those vehicles, shouldn't we? Yes. Like, so yeah, I mean, Muldoon yes. said he's told them time. Can with oh dangerous dinosaurs outside. Yeah. The rest of the group join him in, as in the control room. They stop the tour program. Ellie Sattler spots West Indian lilac, which is poisonous, but can find no trace of the plant in the dino's droppings. In a bid to solve the mystery of the sick tri triceratops, Ellie leaves the group to help out the vets who have a diesel-powered jeep, so can ferry Dr. Sattler back to the compound later as they make their way to the boat. As they never tell us why the Triceratops is sick every six weeks. We never find do out, you, do we? Do you want me to tell you? No, we do Go find on. out. It's a Lycian contingency. No, that's nothing to do with it. No, but that is every... They have to be fed every six weeks. But that's nothing to do with why this Triceratops is sick every six weeks. The wolf, so what was the what was the um, well it, from the book and it was a stegosaurus in the book rather than a triceratops um then the triceratops didn't have suitable teeth for grinding food and so in the same way that birds do then the triceratops would swallow rocks and use them as gizzard stones in yep. so in the digestive tract then they they'd grind up the food uh, because the teeth weren't doing a good enough job but six weeks of doing that the rocks would become too smooth, so the animal would regurgitate them. And then when finding new rocks to use, it would end up accidentally also swallowing some of the lilac berries. But it, because it was throwing up the berries and the stones, then it wasn't in the poo. That's your explanation. Ah. Yeah. But again, I mean, the Triceratops is more fantastic animatronics, and it's such a cute scene watching sort of Alan sort of leaning against it as it breathes. Oh, but that was so cute. I love that bit where he's just like, you know, sort of like almost giving, sort of hugging it. It's so sweet. And he's he just in that moment seems so like, oh my God, I'm touching an actual dinosaur. You know? It's the first time we see any kind of fatherly instinct come out of him as well. Yeah. yeah. He's but it's also, that, it's, that it's annoying to sweet. me because why have they got West Indian lilac there? This is a controlled environment where you've got very expensive dinosaurs. And let's look at it purely from a, a point of view of, of sort of finances. These assets are really expensive to make and maintain and keep. Why would you allow a plant growing there that is known to be toxic? You would really want to minimize any sort of threats to their health, certainly. Yeah. They're you, just you kinda, terrible yeah, scientists. Okay, they're not eating it, it's fine. But something's making them sick. Just get rid of the lilac. 
Yeah. I think it goes goes to it being a real rush job. Like, yes, they understand that this is a problem they should probably do something about, but they've got a huge list of problems and not yeah. enough time to do anything about them. Mm. Yeah, so we, and this really is also we start to see the storm like coming in. Yeah. And we get the lovely line that um, that is indeed one big pile of shit. I, I just love that shot. That shot of him sort of just strutting up to this giant mountain of poo that's like six feet tall. It's just so ridiculous. I don't know why. I just love that bit. Yeah, the size of the Triceratops didn't really... Co- yeah, correlate the, the, with the, the size the of the is that, pile. Is that meant to be just like one business? It, because I cannot believe that much business coming out of that dinosaur. Yeah, it looked well, like even it if it's multiple businesses, you still have to be standing on a I mean, stepladder to get that high. Yeah. Well, maybe it's got a little triceratops sized stool that it gets up and sort of does its business. And... I think that was a triceratops sized stool. That was the problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Also, it got me that the vet was really happy for these people to help out, but he never asked at any point who they were or yeah. what their credentials were. I guess he assumed because they were there that they were experts. But it They was might have been briefed like, hey, that these experts guys. were going to be at the park. Yeah. I'd have been just... surprised if they weren't, but, you know, a lot of this seems to have been orchestrated pretty poorly on the part of... It would have been a bit boring for us as the audience to watch him, like asking the credentials and checking that and not really adding anything to the story for doing it. Uh, an approaching tropical storm forces the tour to be cut short as most of the staff leave by ship for the mainland. Smart. Smart. Yeah, those were the wise people. But yeah. all the staff and workers are leaving by boat, uh, not necessarily due to the incoming storm, because I think a lot of it was just it's end of shift and they have to get off the island. But if it's if it is because of the incoming storm, a, why are the guests staying there? Because you'd want the guests off as well. And B, who's carrying out the day-to-day activities inherent with running a game or park reserve? Because there doesn't seem to be anybody there apart from the characters we see in the film. Who's who's doing the basic tasks of cleaning up poop and things like that? We would assume that there'd have to be a reasonable sized staff taking care of just the maintenance and running of this place. Yeah. It's a huge undertaking. It's just a really, really poorly run park. It's yep. extremely poorly run, you know? <laughs> we then switch to the shot of Nedry, who is on a, a video call to the island's dock, trying to get the ship to wait for him as he goes to steal the embryos. Uh, in order to steal the embryos, he starts up a program that shuts down security systems throughout the park. But this also causes the Tor's electronic cars to lose power and the electrified fences to shut down thus releasing some of the dinosaurs from containment. Has to press a big button that says execute. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we do see storm footage of the actual Hurricane Iniki hitting the island, and yeah. that was just sort of sliced in. Uh, also, I don't know if anybody else noticed, I know Sammy did because I pointed it out. Hi. But, but when he was on the video call to the dock, oh, yeah. there was a playback bar at the bottom that was going across, which was random, because if it was a live call, you wouldn't have that. Yeah. It was blatantly a video being played, but they didn't mask the bottom off at all, so... Yeah, it's really obvious in some shots, and I don't know why they put that in at all. Yeah. Also, he said he did a test run that took 20 minutes. Uh, how did he test it without raising any suspicion whatsoever? Yeah. Yeah, how did that not get noticed? Yeah. So uh, There's a lot of questionable computing in this movie, though. <laughs> there really no. is. There genuinely is a lot of questionable computing in this movie. <laughs> and I'll be honest, I didn't really notice it in the 90s, but now I'm just, oh my god, you guys. Joe, you you do programmy stuff, don't you? Mm-hmm. Two million lines of code, does that seem a lot or not? For that time, probably not. I don't know, that struck me as, as, you know, I didn't think of that scene that, that much in the way of code. I don't know what a standard sort of operating system type thing that I would have these days, but when they said two million lines of code, my initial thought was, that's not that many. Mm. Yeah. For a big park guess, system, no. No. I said he's just being arrogant. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, we get suspicious Nedry acting very suspiciously. Um... Uh, and I would see the other thing is that the fact he's saying he's recompiling the phone system, so that'll take other systems offline as well. It's like, that's not how a complex system like that would work. And yet it's they just... all just go, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, what? 
What? Why aren't you going? No, wait a minute. That doesn't sound right. Have you put this through change control? Have you done anything exactly. to, to validate this? Yeah. Like, have you tested this in development at all? Is, you know, come on, this is... Do we have some change control yeah, process here? but the best part was when, oh yeah, let's turn it off and on again, and all the changes that he's done will suddenly magically disappear. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have yes. so many notes on that <laughs> one. When we get to that, I have notes aplenty. Yeah. Oh no. So I, I'm just going to go with the computer science in this made me angry. Yeah, as me much too. as pretty much any film slash TV trying to do computers does, except for the very, very few that actually get it right. I know the weather's coming in, but it also got dark really quickly. I have a question about yes. what he's doing here. Uh, I understand that he needs to get to the embryos and get out mm -hmm. again without being seen so he's done this shenanigans so he can do that but why as part of that has he taken down the entire security for the whole park so they don't know where he is because if he just took down the security yeah. for the areas he was going in they'd be like oh he's gone and looked at the embryos yeah, and so I take the security down, and I can see he takes some some of the fences down because he has to go through the park to get to the. That dock. was my so other question. To... Why does he have to go through the park to get to the dock? There's no way that they'd have it set up like that. They'd have a go around the outside, not through the dangerous dinosaurs, for getting the yeah. stuff to and from the lab. Yeah, the no, agreed. Uh, and you know, even yeah. if they built something in the center of the, I guess the idea is that the visitor center is the center of the island, and and. You have to go through everything to get to it. But yeah, again, lovely park design. Yeah. To be perfectly honest, he'd have been better going on the bloody road because then he wouldn't have ended up in a ditch. Exactly. Well, I think, yeah. I did love, though, the fact that the CCTV clearly has the words video surveillance system written on the side of it, just in case you're not sure yeah. what it is. You have to have, you have, to have <laughs> those things that tell you mm. what's going on so that you know what's going Otherwise, on. Otherwise, how are you supposed to know anything ever? Yeah. yeah. Ray Arnold notices an irregular activity on the computer systems and tries to log in to find out what's wrong, but Nedry has locked down his workstation. Uh, Hammond initially dismisses that there is a problem and points out that Nedry said it was compiling and that a few systems would drop off for a short time. Anyone else rem reminded of the XKCD <sighs> cartoon with the guys having a lightsaber battle on the back of spinny chairs going, <laughs> compiling! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I love the fact that, well, I say love, it annoyed me that Ray Arnold goes, Oh, I hate this hacker crap when he sort of when the screen locks down, but I'm fairly sure that's not what hacker crap is. Yeah, no. <laughs> also, I noticed that Cambridge, uh, Nedry's people are in Cambridge, mm. which, <laughs> as an Oxford person, made me smile. Does Cambridge, Cambridge is evil? <laughs> no, because it's just you know not Oxford, so they're yeah, exactly. inferior. So you know we're it's the rival. So if anyone's going to get blamed, then yes. Yeah. yeah, I did also this my my major beef with this film then comes up is the fact that the tour gets cancelled. So they have to make their way back to the main system. So fair enough. But they seem to be then having the cars going back the way they came. So is there some sort of loop system to bring them back round or because by design, you would have it so that you would start off at point A and go all the way around to back to point A. Yeah, yeah, that's what it does. But in this case, what they seem to do is they go all the way around to point sort of halfway between or whatever, somehow magically turn both vehicles around and then go back the way they came. They're yeah. on a track. Yeah, but at what point in that track would you have the option to turn around? Yeah, they should be going in reverse. Yeah. Think of it as a sort of as a train line. You would only be able to do that if you actually did a loop somewhere and brought them the back round. Maybe there's but... a siding somewhere so that they can take yeah. off cars. My brain hurts. I need a diagram. <laughs> Once again, this is poor park design. I didn't yeah. realise they didn't go backwards. Stuff, this, everything about this park is bad. I would give it such a terrible review on Travelocity. I would not go. Yeah, Even before the dinosaurs get loose. This park makes yeah. me anxious. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and they, they they haven't even seen any dinosaurs other than when they went rogue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so obviously what's happened is they've gone back and there just happened to be a case that they're outside of the T-Rex enclosure when the power goes. Of course. So 
They they stop outside of this T-Rex paddock. Gasp. Uh, and yes, the electric fences have gone as well, so suddenly the T-Rex can get out. And the goat is gone. And the goat, go- the goat is indeed gone. And the kid finds yep. those night vision goggles, and I was like, oh cool, this is going to be important, and then it wasn't. No, no and then you look through like the night vision goggles, and they just did, everything was vaguely green, and no clearer than it was anywhere yeah. else. Yeah. Um, um, the night vision goggles were important in the Lego game, because it meant that you could see in the dark places without a torch. Well, that sounds much more useful than it was in the film. Apparently they yeah, played think... a bigger role in the book, but I haven't read the book, so... I think they do as well, actually, yeah. So T-Rex escapes its enclosure and proceeds to wreck the tour vehicles that have stored outside of it. Oh, Gennaro no. panics, runs away and hides in the toilets. You missed which... out the, the glass of water rippling on the dashboard, which is oh, very yes, iconic. Yes, yeah, sorry, I did. Um, so yes, we, we they stall and they're sitting there, the rain's coming down. Uh, Alan Grant manages to fill his entire cabinet, uh, entire, um, what are they called, cantina? Canteen of water? Yeah, canteen. canteen. This entire canteen of water just by holding it out in the rain for 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then having played with the very expensive looking um, night vision goggles, Lex, uh, sorry, Tim notices that there's a dull thud coming. Mm. And we know uh, this because the water They have the vibrating. mirror vibrating and then you look and you can see the glasses of water slowly vibrating as something heavy lands and then the dawning realization coming on the faces of them i think is very well played mm. yeah. so this glass of water rippling it seems like such a you know a- an easy effect to achieve but actually they had a lot of trouble trying to get it to work wow. e- eventually uh, what they uh, when they were trying out lots of different ways to do this they put a glass of water onto a guitar and when mm. they plucked the strings, then it, it rippled in the way they wanted it to. So they attached a guitar string underneath the dashboard of the Ford Explorer. <laughs> and then, so someone underneath there was plucking this guitar string to make the glass ripple. <laughs> That's wow. It seems such a simple thing, but yeah, no. I mean, nowadays it'd just be CGI. No one would yeah. think an yeah. about it. But... Yeah. So yes, there's something coming. And um, we see the... Uh, the sort of wires of the electric friends just get torn and f- sort of fall away. And then, yes, the T-Rex makes its appearance for the first time in this film. Best moment. Uh, best moment. Loud roars, purely animatronic, rain sort of streaming down. Um, it really is an iconic shot. Um, so, yes, Gennaro panics, runs away and hides in the toilet. Oh, no, no. Which... Gennaro loses his head. <laughs> Uh, later. No, I mean, to be it fair, twice. <laughs> to be fair, I think running and hiding in the toilet's not the worst idea. I can understand why he did that. Um, I don't understand why Lex turned the light off and then turned light on and then couldn't turn it off. But... I yeah, I that that really that annoyed weird. me that she somehow yeah. didn't know how to turn it off. Mm. Or just point it at the floor yeah. so it wasn't shoot, shining out. Yeah. So yes, we have a, uh, Lex sort of scrambles into the back of the Explorer and finds a large, powerful uh, flashlight, uh, lights it, but that attracts the T-Rex, which then starts to attack the vehicle, smashing its glass roof before flipping the vehicle and trapping the children inside. As we hear from Grant in the other vehicle, that as long as they stay very still, they'll be fine because the T-Rex sees movement. Yeah. Which isn't actually the case but what? but yeah. in That's this world true, in but... in jurassic park world it is yeah there's no well, way it's in hell that but it's the sticking its don't know snout that. up against them that is not gonna see them if they don't move uh the thing is though that it's not even the case because in the later films of the jurassic i think it's two or possibly three they debunk their own myth as well <laughs> yeah i think didn't, didn't so. we ask the question if it can only see you when you're not moving how is it not constantly running into like trees and, and, <laughs> yeah and, yeah that's big rocks awesome question this, like this is this is like the epitome of all predators it would have very good vision yeah <laughs> yeah dr grant jumps out with a flare and tries to distract the t-rex dr malcolm thinking it's helping does the same and is in critically in, and is critically injured when the t-rex attacks him Gennaro is killed when the t-rex crashes through the flimsy structure of the toilet block and <laughs> bites down on the screaming lawyer uh, fun, fun fact oh, here um in the 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 script it, uh, Dr. Malcolm was just going to run run away in the same way as um, Gennaro, is that his name? Yeah. Uh, in the same way as that. Um, but 
uh, it was Jeff Goldblum who was like, uh, <laughs> we could make this a bit more heroic and and yeah. have me distracting the dinosaur first rather than just liking it. Uh, so that's why he's he's doing that. That was Jeff Goldblum's idea. Thank you, yeah. Jeff. You're a good egg. Uh, Grant manages to escape with Lex down the other side of the enclosure, but the, the lead Ford Explorer and Tim is pushed over the edge by the T-Rex and falls down into the void on the other side. On this massive precipice that wasn't there earlier. Yeah. The vocalisations of the T-Rex are now pretty iconic. Um, probably completely accurate, but still, I still think they're brilliant. Also, as we said, the whole vision based on movement thing. No. No. I have a fun fact about the animatronic for the T-Rex here. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you can imagine how complex this T-Rex animatronic was. Uh, some oh, of yeah. those complexities didn't interact particularly well with all the rain that was being poured down on it. Oh, no. And so there were some sensors that just occasionally would go a little bit awry. So the T-Rex would sometimes just randomly come to life. <laughs> they'd be eating their oh, lunch, I'm... you know, they'd be like no. on a break and things, and the T-Rex would suddenly just come to life on them, scaring the bejeebas out of everyone. I, yeah, oh, I can terrifying. see that. Can you wasn't... imagine how scary that would be? Wasn't there also a thing where um, they would occasionally break down so someone had to crawl inside? to fix them and then occasionally they would get stuck oh or am I just that wouldn't surprise me either yeah i mean this uh, whole scene is iconic but not exactly you know with not being littered by inconsistencies i mean I, and i can see the comic appeal of, of the lawyer getting eaten so the blood soaking lawyer gets his sort of is the first one to die uh, but there's no way on earth that toilet was even vaguely plumbed in no. So if he was, was planning on evacuating himself in fear, you know, it, it wouldn't have gone anywhere. Clearly there were unfinished elements in this park. Yeah. Like the obviously not plumbed in toilet there. Well, like having a public toilet there surely indicates that they're free to get out of the cars there as well, which surely would be a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. Absolutely yeah. terrible. Maybe idea. it was for park workers. Maybe. But your, your park workers, you wouldn't put toilet signs on them because that would just, you know, yeah. entice people out. Yeah. All the park buildings should just be sort of bland, non-signed, just hidden Sta buildings. Staff only type thing. Yeah. Well, you sign saying staff only. Maybe it was just for effect. Yeah. Maybe it's a terrible, terrible park. It is a terrible, terrible park. It's an extremely <laughs> terrible park. I think there's no question about that. But so I said that points. that... That must have been a, a what a thirty foot drop or something. This that suddenly appeared on the other side of yeah. this sort of yeah. Where did that fence. come from? Well, yeah, two questions: a) where did that come from, and b) bearing in mind that Timmy was in the Explorer as it went over the end and wasn't wearing a seatbelt. How is he not dead? Because it landed in the tree; it didn't plummet down to moving. the bottom. But it plummeted a reasonable distance. Yeah, but it then the tree good... broke the fall. And he is limping mm. from that point on. I, guess. I don't know how Timmy is not dead, considering well, what happened to him. We, we have a, we, we did uh, postulate a theory yesterday that the scientific miracle in this is not the dinosaurs, it's the mutating power of Timmy it's and that Timmy. he's indestructible. Yeah, Timmy, Timmy, unbeknownst to Timmy, he is an elder of the universe and therefore banished from death's realm. Yeah, that is just a very young X Man or something. Because frankly, he just he should be dead several times. Over. Yeah, he should. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. In the meantime, lost and confused but carrying the stolen embryos, Nedry battles through the storm trying to hand over the embryos to his contact. He crashes the jeep, because he's an idiot, and whilst trying to winch it free, he encounters a venin-spitting Dilophosaurus. And, in a small way, justice is dealt. Yay! Uh, I mean, this is the first time we see the Dilophosaurus, so as we said, we're not actually sure what it and is. So the whole so spitting cute. And... So cute! And you so know that it's it's gonna you know mess him up as soon as it shows up. Oh yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But it's so yeah. Cute. I mean, this is sort of film where justice is served. Yeah. So that's the kind of movie I like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I liked also justice. that when he falls down the cliff, he loses his glasses. I'm not sure how much the glasses would help him, but it's nicely sort of got them out of the way, sort of thing. I I have a fun fact here. Do you go mm -hmm. on. Um. So you might have noticed in this scene that we don't see the Dilophosaurus. Did I do it right? 
You did. Well we done. don't see the Dilophosaurus actually walking at any point. <laughs> he just kind of he turns around and it's there each time. He, he yep. looks to his side and it's there. Uh, that uh, they they couldn't get the walk right for the for the animatronics and things. They, and the, mm. uh, they couldn't work out like the weight shifting movement for this one. So to to combat that, then they they cut a trench into the floor of the set for the puppeteers, and then just had it appear. <laughs> and it works. It I mean, you, know, you don't lot. necessarily need to see it moving. So it, it's more ominous because it, it's yeah. just appearing like that. Yeah. Um. The in this particular scene as well, then uh, Spielberg. Uh. I mean, he he had an awful lot of water going through this, but he wanted mm. more uh, and more and more. And and that's so greedy. St- he st- still to this day <laughs> says that he, he he thinks that scene needed more water. <laughs> yeah, and in a final insult, the now late Dennis Nedry shaving foam can holding <laughs> the stone and embryos gets lost in the mud. Although I couldn't work out how Nedry gets splatted by the the dinosaur. Um, it misses fully, so he he sort of climbs on up, then gets hit in the eyes, so he gets blinded, gets into the car, and then suddenly the dinosaurs are in the car how with him. How did it get in the car? And Does and a lot bigger. Well, yeah, not just that, but also, I mean, the the bigger bit is probably just the, the the perspective on the camera. But that passenger side door was never open, so how did it get in? So it got in through the driver's side, or the window was open, or something, you know, equally as bland. Mm. Maybe well, when the window he was... wouldn't be open. It was throwing it down with. Maybe when he was trying to sort out the whole winching malarkey, he yeah, opened the doors that were door. open, at, 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 you know, on the car. Um, I just want to nip back to something you said that justice was served on on um, the characters in this film. I don't think justice was served on all the characters and all the characters that were killed did not deserve to die. I think the most sort of ironic justice would have been if one of the grandchildren had actually died. Oh, you monster. Well, what? Because Hammond was the one that came up with his dangerous dangerous park and he's the only one out of our cast that doesn't ever actually face a dinosaur exactly mm. the one thing that i've not ever understood about this is we get a scene later on where he's talking about his origins and the fact he came from scotland and he had a flea circus and that but i've not ever worked out the link between someone who has flea circuses and parks and like that <laughs> then suddenly becoming the ceo of a um you know a biological sort of what's the thing what's the word i'm looking for um genetic engineering company it seems a bit of a leap somehow there's a story there, there. must have been a few stages yeah. between that yeah. that just potentially seemed like too much exposition well i mean he's actually. ancient now so and if memory serves in the book he does actually get killed by dinosaurs <gasps> in the book um and this is a vague spoiler but we have to listen to this podcast. You know this podcast is littered with spoilers. Don't be surprised. Um, in the book, he gets eaten by compies, which are small sort of... Compisaurus. They are sort of small... Orange in Lego. Sorry. Yeah, small little <laughs> chicken-sized things. And he gets killed by them, but he didn't get killed by them in the film. Um, and I believe, from what I remember, um, Richard Attenborough did ask, why did I not die? And Spielberg simply said, sequel. That's fair. Sorry. Well, yep. Yeah. Mm. And in fairness, I don't think I would like to see Richard Attenborough die either. No, like, that that's would be not sad. a scene I'd enjoy. No. <laughs> Doctor Sattler and the Park World and Muldoon arrive in the Jeep at the site of the T Rex attack to find an injured Malcolm and the remains of Gennaro. Mm. But everyone else has disappeared. They load Doctor Malcolm into the Jeep for heading down to the T Rex paddock to search for the other explorer and signs of the children or Doctor Grant. Well, no, um, doesn't Ellie look over the embankment and find the other jeep? That's why they go yeah. down into the paddock. Yeah. Because otherwise, that's a random place to start looking. Uh, the T-Rex returns just as they get back to the jeep and gives chase before being outpaced by the gas-powered jeep. But we get the puddle oh, rippling the... this time to warn us. And Dr. Yeah. Malcolm sat on the jeep and in, in, in quite a calm mm. voice just going, I'm fairly alarmed here. Yeah. <laughs> 
I just love it. It's a very excellent delivery. A a very good line. And then, and then, there's some comments about going faster. I can't remember the exact. Must go faster. Must go faster. faster. Must Must go faster. faster. Yes. Which again then was echoed in in Independence Day, which we've always Mm -hmm. done on this one. But this, we've already been told that the T Rex only goes thirty two miles an hour, and I feel like it's quite easy for a jeep to go. Or a Ford Explorer, or whatever it is, to go faster than thirty-two miles an hour in a hurricane. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, not even that. I mean, the thing is, though, that also they said that the T Rex is thirty-two miles an hour would have been an open area once he's got some speed up. This is, you know, this Ford Explorer could not to thirty is going to be what five seconds at the yeah. most, and it's a four-wheel drive, so the weather's not going to be that much of a yeah. Sorry, it was a Jeep, wasn't it? Not the Explorer, but the Jeep. Again, four-wheel drive, not going to be that much of an issue. So. Yeah, it seems like they, they really should have got away, pulled away from the T-Rex a lot quicker than they actually did. But that wouldn't have been as thrilling. You're right, it wouldn't have been. So yes, we um, somehow Timmy survives the Ford Explorer being pushed over the How? ledge. Um, right. Despite not where I'm going. And, the, and then the, the, the Ford Explorer landing on them when they're on the ground as well. But he's fine yeah. that also. He's all fine. Yeah. And then the comments about, oh, back in the car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but not in the tree. <laughs> and you also get the thing where Ellie and Muldoon both say they've found half of Gennaro. But mm-hmm. does that mean the T-Rex just killed the lion and didn't eat they him? They didn't say half. Unlikely. They said part, part. of him. Uh, so I'm thinking yeah, okay, maybe a enough. hand and a foot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Although how they identified mm. that as being Gennaro, I'm not quite sure. The suit, mm. yeah. Possibly the suit. Possibly, possibly the a bit of suit. Yeah. yeah. Maybe there was a head. Yep. That kind of did go straight into the mouth, though. It seems yeah, unlikely that would have survived. Yeah, I feel like unless I don't know, unless the head was just really unpalatable, and and the dinosaur subsequently yacked it up. <laughs> Grant and the kids spend the night sheltering up a tree, just myself out. watching Ew. the herd, watching a herd of brachiosaurs gaze, grazing nearby. Lex is initially frightened, which, considering what she's been through, is understandable. Yep. But Grant reassures her and the audience that brachiosaurs are peaceful herbivores and that That's dinosaurs so aren't monsters, they're just animals. Vegisaurus, as best. she refers to them. Misunderstood. Like them. Once more, we are given the opportunity to appreciate the beauty and majesty of these magnificent creatures. And then they sneeze. Oh my god, it was so cute! Also, it seems to have stopped raining, which means this tropical storm must have lasted about 40 minutes. This was the next morning. No, it stopped raining at night. There were, yeah, when they went they to, sleep to sleep in the tree, yeah. it wasn't raining. Yeah. Which means that it's... In fact, actually, when there were... When with the previous scene with um, sort of Malcolm being put into the back of the truck, yeah. it wasn't raining then either. Yeah. M- maybe so the, the foliage so this, was um, obscuring the rain. No, this, this <laughs> rain was... This, this entire storm seemed to have lasted oh, 10 minutes. Cool. But they had to evacuate the island for the sake of it, even though it was... Well, this is why I wonder if they were evacuating the island or it was just literally a shift change, but... I'm sure they said that they had to get everyone off the island because of the storm. But again, why would you then leave the guests there? Because they weren't saying the guests had to leave. Well, I think they probably were wanting them to leave, but uh, leaving that up to Hammond to deal with, really. Hmm... It was his kids, uh, his grandkids. I also, think. we see the scene that when he's settling into the tree, Alan Grant sits on that raptor claw he's been carrying around. Yeah. It's like, if he's been carrying that in his back pocket, I can't believe that's the first time he's ever sat on that thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's not comfortable. And then it just ends it's up nervous. being dropped and being entirely irrelevant. And so I don't understand why that was even a thing. I think that was just the, the acceptance by Grant that actually dinosaur bones have lost their importance scientifically because yeah. you don't need to dig them up anymore you can just get eaten by them instead yeah, yeah that's such a great alternative except i think that is that is what that was showing i don't think he would have frog i don't think he would have wanted to preserve those things any less still no i agree i think that the throwing of the uh throwing of the toe um blade doesn't necessarily seem particularly consistent with the character yeah. but no. I'm guessing that's that's what they were trying to sort of convey, if nothing else. We see Ellie and John in the visitor centre restaurant eating ice cream. Uh, Ellie says that she has given Malcolm morphine and made him as comfortable as possible. No, 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 don't. Isn't doesn't that open with Jeff Goldblum in his 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 distressed pose? No, that's not till later. That's not till later, and Damn. believe me, I would not let that pass without comment. 
I yeah, we don't see I we don't see Jeff reclining until in a few minutes. Okay, I'm fanning myself thinking about it. Oh my but, god! Yeah. yeah, at this point he's in like the restaurant area eating the yeah. melting ice cream. Right. John Hammond discusses his first attraction at Flea Circus in Petticoat Lane, London. And it's about halfway through this scene when he suddenly goes back to a Scottish accent again. <laughs> yes, quite. So odd. John fails to see that he has lost control of the park, and indeed may never have had it. But Ellie tries to make him see that the important thing now is to ensure that the people they love, Dr. Grant, Lex and Tim, are safe. Can I make a comment here? Yeah. Mm. On the accent thing. Uh-huh. <clears throat> so Daisy, you keep on saying that it's really weird that he keeps on lapsing into a Scottish accent. He doesn't keep on though, that's the thing. In the opening scene he was very, very Scottish. Mm-hmm. And then in and then not at all again until halfway through this one scene. Yeah. Yeah. I just think that's kind of ironic because when you go, when you went home, you were completely northern, and then you talked to talked to us and no no trace of accent whatsoever. So I really don't think that it's that much of a leap to assume that you know maybe. Yeah. Also, bearing in mind that he is talking about. I mean, I agree. Reminiscing it's it's type inconsistent, thing. but he's reminiscing about his his past, so that might bring. In that case, yeah. It's... But then, why is he so Scottish? Because he's not even half that Scottish in this scene. Why is he so no. Scottish in the first scene? That first scene does seem to stick out. It somewhat, just yeah. seems it like stick Russell out Dutton out forgot first. that he was supposed to do a Scottish accent. Yeah. It didn't stick out to me. I, I, it I didn't to me, but I'm sure it will next it, time I watch it. Uh, unless you'd have pointed it out. Yeah. It's because when he first started talking in the first scene, I was like, whoa, I don't remember him being Scottish. What's, oh, because like, I'd only seen it once before this. It's like mm-hmm. if I just remembered Richard Attenborough's character in this completely differently, and then that was it. From that point on, he wasn't. So I was like, okay, um, what happened to the Scottish? I did also like that this this scene opened up with a sort of a scene of the gift shop. Um, we had yeah. previously um, Dr. Malcolm talking about slapping logos on lunchboxes and then we actually see the lunchboxes. Mm. But it also reminds you this park is supposed to be a place of fun, not of horror. Yeah. yeah. Also slightly weird that a paleobotanist seems to know how much morphine to give someone. You know, I just, I, I wonder if they're just, you know... Um... There's some sort of dosage guide on the packet. Yeah, could be. Or, or like th- where you can get like, like the you... needles preloaded with a one dose. With one dose, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, you have to give the right amount per um, amount of weight that the person is generally with these things. So she'd have to know how much he weighed. Well, she could have asked him. Well, that, she could have she? asked him. Yeah. Yes. And he would have been like, blah, blah, blah pounds. Yeah, exactly. And so he probably she... would have lied. And he well, probably exactly. would have slightly <laughs> embellished the truth. But I would know. assume it's that, being a scientist, that some sort of medical training would have been done, especially being on a dig and, you know, potential for injury. Yeah, she uh, might have been the designated she's first a course aider. In basic first aid. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. My yeah. office has them and we're university administration. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, it didn't seem that odd that she would know how much morphine to give him. No, she, it just struck me as it just struck me as being a bit she odd. Does, so. She does come across as a very kind of capable woman. Oh who, God, yes. she picks yes. up these things anyway. So I, very I practical, totally believe very her. capable. Yeah. She's smart. Yeah. Oh my god, yes. Dr. Grant, Lex and Tim wake up in the morning to find a brachiosaur grazing nearby. Aww. Lex starts to panic, but Dr. Grant assures her that she is safe and she should think of the huge plant eater as being just like a very large cow. Oh, and it's so cute. Which immediately made me wonder what they taste like. However, this cow seems to have a cold and sneezes all over Lex. Less cute. Yeah. Um, they get Even down from the I've tree. Got a cold. There is banter between Tim and Lex. Uh, and Lex says she, says that she is a hacker and not a computer <laughs> nerd. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, oh and I did God. note that a lack of any understanding in this film as to what, an, what exactly a hacker is is quite worrying. Oh, yep. honey. They throw oh, the term honey. around in such a way that they blatantly have no idea what it means. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is before the film Hackers, Hackers. came out to explain to him. <laughs> <laughs> Which told us all what hackers yeah, were. Yeah, yeah, it did, yeah. Walking back to the visitor centre, Grant stumbles upon a dinosaur nest hidden in the roots of a tree. As Malcolm had said, life finds a way. Yep, exactly. Timmy says that his grandpa said all the gar- dinosaurs were girls, so they couldn't breed. 
But he wasn't actually there for that part of the tour, so I assume he'd seen that a different time. I assume at some point he's had some kind of conversation with his grandpa about what's this big undertaking that you've been working on, grandpa. He did have an awful lot of dinosaur actually intelligent questions for Dr. Grant earlier on, so I imagine he's probably bombarded anyone with that. To the extent that for sure he's probably talked with his grandpa about his big dinosaur project. Or any of the lab people he ever got introduced to. But I mean, the, the the first thing he 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 said to to Doctor Grant was that he'd read his book. Yeah, this kid is super into this business. Yeah, man. yeah, he was of that age. Yeah. With Malcolm injured and the park systems offline, Arnold is forced to make a drastic decision and reset the systems, cycling the power on the systems with the hope that they will come back in an optimal state once rebooted. There are so many things wrong with this bit of a film. <laughs> We just have to enter an alternate world. No, 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 no. Okay, one thing I will say about this scene. This is the Jeff pose. That is the only good thing about this bit. Oh, that's the best thing about this Is the shot of him just draped over this table with his shirt open and he's just sort of... So Draw ridiculous. me like one of your French girls. <laughs> like he's just he's, he's just got like an injured leg or whatever. He doesn't have to be that sexy and he manages oh, to make it so oh, 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 sexy. Oh. He he just is sexy. I mean, it's oh, not I like know. he is trying at all. He he is I just know. he's a very handsome man. I follow his Instagram, sexy. you know. I didn't I, I I didn't so notice amazing. I didn't notice his lounging. No, he doesn't do anything for me either to be honest. This didn't clock with me at I, all. I don't no. get it. Uh, however, the act of uh, recycling the crush. power. I, I, I one, hang on. one celebrity crush, and it's this man. I'm sorry. We just have You're to take a moment crush. to appreciate the complete awesomeness of Jeff Goldblum. He seems like a nice person. Mm-hmm. He, it, seems it, like he does. He does seem with. like a nice person. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't get the Jeff Goldblum thing though. That's okay. But he's just so There's... comfortable with being the damsel in distress in this film, you know, being <laughs> the clever clogs, but also being completely comfortable with being afraid and, and needing to be saved. And it's just, it's always struck a chord. And, and then nice. it sort of negates all the really shitty computer stuff, which makes me very <laughs> angry. Oh, yes, because yeah. we're about to get to that. Because although there is Jeff, Perfect. there is also some lovely, lovely MacGuffins for computer Which is why I wanted right. to take a moment to appreciate yes. Jeff. <laughs> Thank you for giving me Ladies and gentlemen, that oh, well, it was as much in. for me as it was for you, Sammy. Strap oh. yourself in. This is going to get interesting. <laughs> um, however, should point Go out on. that the act of recycling the system does also uh, free the rest of the dinosaurs, including the vicious velociraptors, from their enclosures. Right. So, they've never tested a full system shutdown. That's shoddy DL planning right there and then. Why would you shut not? the system down by just throwing some switches? Yep. You don't even initiate any shutdown routines on the server. You just throw some switches. Mm-hmm. There's no UPS backup, so, you know. It's not important. It's not like there's going to be dinosaurs let loose if it just has a power cut. There's oh no you reboot the system. redundancy. There's no separation of concerns. There's no... The, the fact that shutting down the damn computer is not going to undo the code <laughs> that Nedry did. It doesn't work that way. It's going to be stored somewhere. It it's going to be perfect. restored from media. Oh, it's brilliant. Oh, I wish computers worked like this. And plus, Not you really that, shouldn't but... just turn it off at the freaking power socket. <laughs> but they turn it off at the freaking power socket. They turn it back on, and all the circuit breakers have tripped. Yeah. Okay, fine, that could happen. Why have you put the circuit breakers so far away from the main switch? Yep. Put them in the same place. So yes, um, there are some issues with this. Some, scene. some. There is nothing but issues with this scene. I did write in my and notes at this point. This Jeff. is so much crap. Yep, I think I need a picture really of a fluffy is. kitten. Arnold goes to the bunker on the other side of the complex to flip the circuit breakers and restore power, but never returns. Of course not, because he got eaten by a dinosaur. Making his way back to safety. I have a fun fact about that. About the dinosaur mm. eating. Yeah. Uh, so 
Samuel Jackson was meant to come back to film his death scene. He was meant to get chased through corridors and eaten by dinosaurs. Uh, but the uh, the hurricane storm that had happened um, meant that he wasn't able to travel there to do the shooting and then they, <laughs> they didn't have time for it anymore. So he never got to film his death scene and he, he was gutted about that. Oh no! Aww. So he was just so dead? Sad. Yeah. So we were supposed to see him die and we didn't. I, I think it was fairly impactful not actually seeing it anyway. I think it was more impactful, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. yeah. Less fun for Samuel L. Jackson, though. Yes. Yeah. But he was rather Making... epic in this, despite the very, very, very bad computer knowledge. Well, he understood this form of computing very well. <laughs> this yeah, wonderful, this magical magic mystery way of computers working. Making their way back to safety, Dr. Grant, Tim and Lex witness a stampede of ostrich-like dinosaurs called Gallimimus. Gallimimus. Gallimimus? Gallimimus. I just call them the Gallies. Stampede of ostrich like dinosaurs known as Gallimimus that wheel and flock towards them. I have a fun fact they run for cover them. as the speedy bird like dinosaurs race past. Well, yeah, because they're flocking towards us, which I think was very sensible. It's like, yes, they, they are running. Yeah, maybe don't run in the same direction. Maybe let them through, but you know. Smart. They hide behind a tree and then move underneath it as they see a T Rex bring down one of the fleet footed two legged dinos. Hang on. I've got a fun fact. Factors, dear factors. Okay, so um, as as they're um, looking one, at them in the distance, five, seven. Le- <laughs> what? Sorry, I was giving you factors. Not oh. factors, facts. As they're looking at them in the distance, Le- Lex asks if these are the meat-eating kind, if they're meatosauruses, and she never gets that question answered. I'd like to answer that question for you. Finally! It's yeah. been 25 years! I know, right? So, these are, in fact, metasauruses, but yeah. they only eat uh, the dinosaur eggs. So they're, yeah. they're uvitarians or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> There's a word for it, and I can't remember what it is. So there you go. Question answered for Lex there, who asked that question yep. 25 years ago. Um, I mean, the Gallimimuses I'll, are wheeling to avoid know. a predator, yet seem to wheel directly towards where the T-Rex turns up. Well, they, they didn't say that they were clever. Yeah, they're pretty dumb. No. Also, Grant says they are wheeling. They they are wheeling like they're avoiding a predator, yet they don't seem concerned about the fact that that predator might actually be sort of where they are. I would are, have thought so. that any predator that's going to eat a, di- a little diddle dinosaur. It's probably going to want to eat a human more because they're bigger yeah, I mean, and have more I, meat. At this point, your concern levels should be quite high, whatever. Yeah. So. yeah, I do not understand why they are not more concerned that they are walking over yeah. fields with dinosaurs in. Yeah. Considering they nearly got eaten by a T-Rex. Yeah, it's and not like they haven't the understood dinosaurs are, are dangerous down. at this point. Mm. I mean, how how stupid are they? Well, it's also a case of they have to get back to the visitor centre, so they've not got a lot of choice. They have to go this way. This is the shortest route. Yeah, but I'm sure uh, there are much safer ways to traverse it. But they haven't got well, a pop, the power's down, map, then have they? Possibly not. <laughs> no one gave them a map. They're, they're basically working on the map they saw in the visitor centre, so they're going from that. So, mm. Fearing the worst, Muldoon and Dr. Sattler go to find Arnold and restore the still-dead power systems. However, on their way to the bunker, Muldoon realises that they are being hunted by the velociraptors. Uh-oh. Mm. Muldoon is outsmarted and killed by the cunning Vlatzers. Only Dr. Sattler manages to race to the bunker and narrowly avoid being killed. That's Robert Muldoon, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Bob. This scene also annoyed me. Not this scene, the scene previously, where they were like, okay, we've got to have to go out and do it. And Muldoon says, well, you can't just stroll down the road. Wo- you can't just stroll down the road. And he breaks out the guns. But that's exactly what they let Ray Arnold do about five minutes yeah. earlier. Mm. And Muldoon didn't seem particularly concerned then. Ah, oh, but, you know, woman needs protecting. Well, I don't think it was that. I, I don't, don't know what it, it was. It, it was, was just, just inconsistent. Inconsistent writing, yeah. Well, yeah, because clearly woman needs protecting. I think it was mere, mere caveman uh, mentality there. No, I disagree I on that one. I don't think it was. I really don't think it was. I think it was literally just inconsistency in the writing. Mm. I'm going to go with they hadn't really thought about the fact it might be dangerous and once Arnold didn't come back then he's gone that kind ah, of cements actually... the danger of the situation uh-huh. yeah yeah. Mm. I mean this is the other thing is the, lapt- the raptors are now 
sort of loose. Um, but the Raptors have been set up as the big threat in this entire movie, but there's less than 30 minutes to go and they've only just really made an appearance. So they've been a sort of a spectre of danger this entire time, but we've never really seen yeah, them. Yeah, it's 103 so minutes than... into the film when we first see our first Raptor. Yeah. Well, it, we see a baby one earlier, yeah. obviously, and we also see the eye of one at the very first scene. But yeah, the first time we see a fully grown deadly raptor is, you know, we are well into the film. I misheard you as laptop, and deadly laptop is much funnier. Deadly raptor. Well, that's okay if they throw them at you, that's the problem. Yeah. Also, the just bunker try turning door. them Ellie... off and on again. They can get really be... hot, those things. Mm. Yeah, Ellie runs to the bunker and opens the door. The door is definitely closed when she goes in, which... Watching it a second, third, fifth time makes you think, well, actually, if something's in there, they must have opened the door. No, not necessarily. There are lots of pipes. I'm not sure they could get in via the yeah, pipes. Pretty so. big, these things. These are two metres tall. But I'm not going to disagree because open, I can't remember, but I'm fairly yeah. certain that there are other ways in there. The door could have been open, and after it had gone through, then you know, it was like a gust of wind blew it closed. Or their tail could be. It might be that Rayanov just didn't close the door properly, but so eventually, Doctor Gra- uh, Doctor Sattler finds her way despite some interference from Hammond in actually turning left or right because he's trying to read a oh map. Oh my god, he is terrible uh, at direction. Finds their way to the. Um, it's not like it's life or death, dude. Uh, power switches to start turning systems on. Including the electric fence that Tim, Lex, and, and Dr. Grant are currently climbing. They yeah. do quite a nice oh. job of cutting between oh. them having to climb this fence and how Ellie is getting on in turning the power back on. Mm-hmm. We keep cutting this between is quite these tense. two. They do yeah. that It's quite tense, but there's no well. way on earth they would have those systems written that large on that display. But you have to be able to read them on the phone. Yeah. I mean, in reality, it'd be a small little sort of handwritten sticky note thing. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, one of someone's those label password. maker printer things stuck on. Yeah. Oh yeah. Grant and Lex oh, like manage those. to get off the fence before it goes live, but Timmy doesn't, and he's thrown back off because the fence Timmy in the shower of sparks jump. and lands. Heart stopped in Grant's arms. Amazing. And Grant yet... manages to restart Tim's heart and seems no worse for the mis- mi- seems no worse for the misadventure. No, it's no. magic. Yeah. So this child I, is just magic. I did a bit of research on whether or not, you know, this would kill him because ten thousand volts seems like a lot. <laughs> um so in my research I found out that it's it's the current rather than the voltage that kills yeah. you. Mm-hmm. So 10,000 volts is no more deadly than 100 volts in your house, uh, it, depending on the current. So it would depend on like um, uh, how ACDC? moist his hands were and things like that. Uh, and so then I was like, okay, so assuming that the current didn't get to the death level and that the current didn't get to the level of muscular paralysis so that he wouldn't have been able to let go of the yeah. fence as well. Uh, yeah. So assuming that was just in the painful shock level, which is the step before muscular paralysis, he, so he, he wouldn't actually have died. So he would still have been hanging onto the fence. So assuming that he managed to somehow have his hands in such a way that the muscular paralysis didn't leave him clinging to the fence and he did die, uh, then I looked into how easy it would be to resuscitate him from that. But apparently, uh, high voltage shocks are easier to artificially resuscitate than low voltage shocks uh, because of the, uh, the the clamping of the heart or because of the high current densities with the heart. Something to do with that. So wow. I was like, okay, I'm going to kind of buy this scenario then. But yeah. would A, he be thrown off and B, because he wasn't earth in any shape or form, what would happen there? Because he was completely on the fence, so he wasn't Earth at yeah, all. Yeah, I don't know about that. I think we need to chuck it up as movie stuff and, you know. <laughs> they didn't want to kill I could only research it. so much of the electrical <laughs> No, yeah. fair enough. I have yeah. all my movie stuff used up with the terrible <laughs> computing. <laughs> yeah. Turning the power on us, turn on the lights in the bunker, and uh, suddenly we see a Velociraptor try and attack Dr. Sattler. I have a fact about raptors if anybody wants one. Go for it. Right. So, as you may know, the uh, National Basketball Association of 
uh, North America, the NBA, um, has a team. Do they still? Yes, they do have a team in Toronto called the Toronto Raptors. I did not know that. And the Toronto Raptors were a big deal in, like, 1993-94. And got their name because they hosted a national uh, competition to pick the um, sort of name and mascot of the new Toronto basketball team. And because of Jurassic Park, people voted for a raptor. So that <laughs> they are literally named after the raptors in this movie. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Cool. And, and this is why you don't let the public that's, name that's things. That's basketball. The uh, baseball team is the Blue Jays, which is based on a bird. They're much less scary. Yeah, well, at least they weren't Bally McBall face or something. I was thinking yeah. basket, but basket face. I'm, gonna, yes, I'm no. just going to put it out there also that if you've ever seen the Toronto Raptors mascot, it looks nothing like anything resembling a velociraptor <laughs> or any other type of raptor-y dinosaur. Any other type of copyrighted uh, design there. You yeah, can't really I... copyright a living creature, can you? I mean, Well, it's... this is a problem with the raptors, is that's not what they look like, so... In fairness... In fairness, I don't think any dinosaurs that we know of would have worn a basketball jersey and a pair of shorts and trainers, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. like True. still, he's a happy looking fella. I feel like Owen Grady could to train them eventually to play basketball. I'm, Possibly. I'm sure if he, you know, Stop them eating the ball, that's the problem. They yeah. play yeah. football in the um, video game. Cool. <gasps> So I think it was very convenient of the raptor to wait until she'd got all the power back on before it made its appearance here. That was very through was the very pipes, like freaking Johnny in um, the hotel room in that film. In the Shining. The Shining. Yeah. Yes, thank you. It was just like being, oh, oh, oh you're busy. Okay, I'll wait. Is <laughs> raptor. Raptors, deadly but very polite. Is yeah. raptor. Yeah, I like that. So she escapes. She manages to escape from the raptor of the hallway, but. Um, then finds the remains of Ray Arnold, or at least his arm. Mm, that was disturbing. And she sort of finds the arm, it sort of flops onto her shoulder, she looks at it, turns around in shock, and then backs away. But obviously she then backs into the uh, the chain fence that's got the raptor on the other side of it. So, so she manages to get out of the bunker and close the door behind her, locking the raptor safely in there. You know, assuming they haven't worked out how to open doors or anything. Yeah. Grant and the kids make it back to the main resort complex, only to find it abandoned. Grant leaves the kids in the main dining area and tries to search for other survivors, quickly running into Ellie. In the meantime, Lex and Tim are cornered by a pair of velociraptors inside the main kitchen. This is quite a funny sequence. It's Okay, it's funny in the video game. So I'm not sure it's that funny. <laughs> Unless you like the idea of two small children being eaten by well, dinosaurs. Well, because they which... don't, but they shove mm. them in the oven and like drop things on their heads and it's kind of a bit farcical. The raptors stalk through the dark kitchen, searching for the kids. Eventually, Tim and Lex manage to lure one of the raptors into a freezer and lock it in. The other raptor, though, chases them out of the kitchen. And this is, you know, that's the first sensible thing I've seen anybody do in this film, is they they lock it in the freezer compartment and then lock the door. Yeah. Yeah, that is a sensible thing to do. Mm. Uh, this this scene that with the raptors in the kitchen uh, because you know, I've, I'd seen this movie once before and not for a very long time this was the only scene that I really remembered anything of from the whole movie so it, it, this mm. did have a lasting impression for people yeah, yeah definitely uh, I think because because you actually you, you, you there was no hiding the dinosaurs it wasn't you know it wasn't the most well lit place in the world but they were there they were front they were center and they were yeah. you know realistic and they were and I think that's possibly why yeah i mean we had the t-rex earlier but far from the brief point where it attacked the gallimimus everything else was in the rain and in the yeah. lightning and in the dark this was you know there was no hiding the flaws in this one and everything was reflective as well so that also we made it more sort of that must have made it interesting to film it took them two yeah. weeks to film this scene and it was the actress who played lex's uh character ariana richards her favorite scene uh but the uh the the raptors were uh were done by the puppeteers in the suits but they could only film them for 15 minutes at a time because in order to be in the suit 
they had to be bent down into like a downhill skiing position, which was Ooh. very difficult to maintain. Yeah, that sounds so uncomfy. Yeah. 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 Just dropping in a fun fact there. Thank you. You're welcome. Meeting up in the control room, Dr. Grant, Dr. Sattler and the kids attempt to restore power and communications to the park, but are trapped in by the same raptor. Uh, in the nick of time, however, the security systems and phone lines are brought back online with Lex and her computer wizardry. Yep. Oh, you just it's skipped. a Unix system. Sure. I know this. Oh, you, you <laughs> skipped like a whole bit there, but I don't really care because this was like very poor version of Hacker's bit with the yeah. visual thing of the, oh, these are well, all the files. Is... It's like, oh my God, if it was this easy, then Samuel L. Jackson would have been able to fix it. Yeah, seriously. Well, this is this is this is the the description of what happens. But then I've got notes underneath that say what my thoughts on this are. Uh, Doctor Grant calls Hammond to tell him to get the phones work, rather to tell him the phones are working, and he should call the main line and get the helicopters. Doctor Grant assures Hammond the kids are safe, but at that point the Raptor branch manages to break into the control room and give chase to our heroes throughout the entire building. Yeah, Lex the hacker, of course. It's a Unix mm. system. No, it's not. My, mm. my it's also husband, the world's slowest interface. My husband is a Unix system administrator, so <laughs> this line often gets quoted in our household. <laughs> I just can't imagine working on that system because you want to, you know, change a variable somewhere. You want to turn on the lights. You have to almost use this flight simulator-esque it's system so to move to the other side. It takes five. I mean, yeah, it's it's done purely because if you had a file structure, you just clicked on it, clicked on something else, there would be no tension because you'd do it within seconds. So yeah. why, how, why is it in a freaking folder? Well, this is again, you just you just can't ask the question, yeah. can you? Really? Yeah. Yeah. There is no explaining yeah. this one. No. Yeah. no. And there's also no explaining where the lighting for the there's there's one scene after they've climbed into the. Um, ceiling that you get this shot of the raptor from underneath and it's underlit with sort of it's it's the g's and t's and c's of the genetic yeah. code but i've no idea where the lighting is coming from because it's underneath yeah. it i mean it's pretty but and it's projecting yeah. it you know mm. uh, forwards as well it's not like a reflection if it, it yeah. backwards then eventually our heroes are cornered by the last two raptors inside the main atrium just as all hope is lost, the T-Rex comes crashing in and attacks the raptors, buying enough time for our small group of humans to escape. I wrote here that the dinosaur skeleton ride in the lobby here is not a fun one. No. no. Mm. The raptors attack the T-Rex, but are quickly killed by the much larger dinosaur. So the, the originally in the script, they were going to have uh, the, the dinosaur skeleton thing there be uh, kind of con controllable and then use that to defeat the Velociraptors. But Spielberg had decided by this point that the hero of the film was the T-Rex. So he wanted to have the T-Rex come back and, and save them. And we get that iconic bit where he's, he's beaten the Velociraptors and the, the banner floats down in front of him. Yeah. In front of I her, mean, I don't sorry. understand how it got in there because every time we've seen the T-Rex so far, you've had like noise and... and and vibrating water and stuff and then suddenly he seems to go into stealth mode and just suddenly appears out of nowhere yeah yep. uh, also i didn't understand that they climbed through the ceiling ducts and climbed onto the hanging exhibits of the dinosaur bones which were fake obviously um but the dinosaur bones broke up and then individual things broke and fell to the floor but as the dinosaur bones broke up, they would have become lighter because there would be less weight on them. So, I don't know. It's all too convenient, really. They were very poorly attached to the ceiling. Well, again, this park is this not what you call up to code. This park is so badly done. Yep. Yep. As the humans evacuate the island by helicopter, the T-Rex gives a final victory roar behind a falling banner proclaiming, When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth. Yay. On the helicopter, yep. Grant is sitting with Lex and Tim, seeming at ease with the children now. He looks out the window to see a flock of pelicans flying over the ocean. Yeah, I didn't understand what the significance of that was. Well, Birds. that's the thing is that, and it's probably more due in the book, there are flying dinosaurs. Yeah, I thought there were pterodactyls or something. In the book? No. Or in, in this? One, well, in one of the movies. In, there are in, in one of the later movies, there definitely is, but and I think it's three that's got them. But in this first film, they couldn't ever get the dinosaurs to fly properly or look convincing, so they didn't have them. But I think in the book, they had the flying dinosaurs. And I think so the, they just put in the general pelicans? idea was... 
<laughs> well, the idea with pelicans just are uh, just in that area, so they were literally just flying ah. pelicans. That was nothing more than actually there are flying dinosaurs, and you can infer from the shot of these pelicans that there's a chance they can get away from the island, sort of thing. Okay, I did Although not that get that from the, the like... pelican shot at all. I was just no, like, why it, have we got this not... lingering shot on these birds? Yeah, I mean, it, that ignores the whole lysine contingency and things like that, but mm-hmm. uh, and apparently in the later novels they get around the lysine contingency because they find plants that have it in there and they just eat the plants. Well, in the... Oh, now... I think this was in the Jurassic Park, the game, the one that Telltale did, that was basically following sort of alongside the events of this movie. Either that or I'm getting mixed up with one of the other movies. The people that Nedry was supposed to meet go out to find him and they're tracking the little um, shaving can thing. It's got a little beepy thing and or whatever and they find that and then they try and get it back. But in get it, trying to get back, they come across... Um, another scientist who I'm now questioning whether this is one of the other movies but anyway she... it's not because I don't know I've seen all the other movies and that doesn't ring okay yeah so they come across the scientist lady who has basically lost all of her researchers because they've been eaten by dinosaurs and whatever but she's been nursing these um specific type of dinosaurs that I forget what they are um and she's like controlling them with like their mating sounds and their feeding sounds and hunting sounds to get them in and out of the enclosure um and because she's so attached to these dinosaurs and she doesn't want them to die when she leaves the island because obviously she has to leave the island she puts something in the main water supply to negate the lysine contingency so basically just undoes all of that things so that the dinosaurs can continue to live and because of that i think then these what were basically were mistakes but like super genetically engineered like mega raptors um i forget what they're called again but they're like these like prehistoric prehistoric dinosaurs they're like mega intelligent they also get that so then basically this this thing is just all about it, it seemed to be a good sort of explanation for getting rid of that license contingency yeah. to you know yeah, getting rid of I that can't, plot point. I mean, but I think that was Jurassic Park the game um that Telltale did. Yeah. And I, I played it. It was it was quite good. I mean I've seen I've seen Jurassic Park The Lost World to so Jurassic Park Two and I've seen Jurassic Park Three, but I've seen them both possibly once or twice and they don't hold up anywhere near as much as this film. Mm. And I've seen the Lost World not the Lost World, what's the new one called? What, um, Jurassic World. Jurassic World. Jurassic world i've seen that once as well but mm. a lot of what i remember because i've read the jurassic park book a couple of times and that's obviously goes into a lot more book. detail I should read the book i like michael Crichton. the book is very good um, the book is the very one good. he does about time travel time timeline or something like that is is a really yeah. really good speaking of the book yeah. michael Crichton estimated that the screenplay for this film has about 10 to 20 percent of the novel's content then yeah, I definitely want the to read the book. The book is a lot more wow. detailed. So sorry, Dave, I interrupted you with saying about the book. No, they the, say so the book, um, they go into the whole lysine thing there, but I can't remember. I've read the book a few times. I've read The Lost World, which is the the novelization of the second one or the second one that as a novel, and I've seen the films, but I can't remember at what point. They definitely go into the whole lysine and, and bypassing it somehow, and I think it's with plants in that version. But yeah, the idea being then that the dinosaurs can actually get off the island. Mm. So the whole pelicans is a... Yeah, dinosaurs can fly, you know. Hint, Some hint. of them can. Yeah. Some of them can swim. I mean, there's a giant freaking water dinosaur in in in, in the Jurassic World that's literally fairly certain it's in a, a tank that's like next to the sea. I can't remember that as well. There, there was yeah. there was something. No, that the, yeah, there was a waterbound dinosaur in that game as well. Um, and because I they think... get trapped in the thing with it, and that is ginormous. Yeah. I think there is also in the new Jurassic World film. Yeah, I believe there's also, from what I've seen in trailers, there is also a waterborne dinosaur in that that does actually get out into the ocean. So. Cool. Oh no. Waterborne. You make it sound like it's the virus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you I mean, mean a water say, dwelling. This, <laughs> yeah. Jurassic Park is a brilliant film, mm. uh, but it's a film where the sequels are of diminishing returns because I was not impressed with three. Of what I've seen and what I remember of seeing of a Jurassic World, it was okay, but it was a different film. Honestly, um, I can't remember enough of two and three to make them distinct films. I just remember there was Ilasona, no. 
and Jeff Goldblum was back, and there was a kid. Yeah, and in the third one, they actually got Dr. Sattler and Dr. Grant back, but I, I honestly cannot remember that I've one. I've seen all. one where a kid is conveniently acrobatic. I don't think I've seen the other one. That's the second one, because I think that's... Um, that's Dr. Malcolm's child, and she is supposed to be going to a gymnastics competition, but she stows away and goes to the island instead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that one I've is kind of very clever. One. See, and I then... always thought that Sam Neill was in one of these and Jeff Goldblum was in the other, so I was surprised when they were both in this one. Is the third one the one where the family hires yeah, I them think to is. go out? Because the little kid is um, got lost. Kid. I don't know. The kid oh, is kind of, kind of amazing. There's then. paragliding, and the scientists help her um, steals a dinosaur egg, which is then where they're tra- chased by dinosaurs. I th- that sounds right, but as I said, it's been so long since I'm I saw just going the film. off the video game. Yeah. Seriously, no. at this point, I, I'm literally the video game is my only connection to splitting these out into three distinct. Four uh, I have one films. final thing for this movie. Mm-hmm. Go on. Body count five. Okay. Human body count. Yes, yeah. human body count. So that's four and two halves. <laughs> well, two parts. Two parts, yes. Yeah. Which I think for the terrifying dinosaurs being unleashed, I think five is pretty good. Mm. Yeah. They only lost yeah. five. And to be fair, how many people got out in the helicopter? Uh, four. So it's over 50%. Five, six. Oh, it's six. about 50%. That's it's not yeah. necessarily there, good. There would have been more if, if the people hadn't evacuated the island. Yeah. Well, technically there were more because there were other people on the island and they died, but we didn't see them. Possibly. Mm. But we didn't see them. Uh, okay, so that is Jurassic Park, 1993's top grossing movie. Yay. Uh, and it is a good one, despite some issues with computers yes yes if you ignore all of that it's an amazing movie if you ignore the fact that scientifically it's still not possible to clone a dinosaur and ignore the fact that scientifically it's still not possible to have that as a unix system um and you ignore you go with it as movie it's absolutely they brilliant a sheep. why can't they clone a dinosaur <laughs> If anyone is interested, though, the DNA of dinosaurs has degraded far too much by this point in our timeline. So we would have mm. to go quite far back in time in order to get to a point. I think it's 6.8 million years it, the DNA is degraded within. So we'd have to go back quite a way to, to when... The- so what we're saying is actually this film just confirms time travel. Yes. Yeah, well, that's yes. what the other Michael Crichton book, that I, the, the one that I've actually read, Time... Timeline, timelines, timelines. yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. that you, I haven't read it, but yeah. yeah. Oh no, it's amazing. Um, I've read it a couple. But of times. But didn't Michael Crichton also do Westworld, the original film? Oh, entirely probably. But I remember distinctly yeah. the had, timeline. He has a but... thing about <laughs> amusement parks going horribly, horribly well, wrong. Maybe he had a traumatic experience as a young child. Quite but possibly. either way, if you combine the timelines book with the Jurassic Park book, then it's feasible. If if they're in the same universe, then that, then then the dinosaurs. Could feasibly have been cloned. And since Michael yeah. Crichton wrote them both, I'm going to go, yes, they are in the same universe. Mm. And that's why they were able to have... Headcanon confirmed. Yep. Sure. And he's no longer around to ask him that question, so... He writes yeah. books that translate very well to screen, much yeah. like Stephen King. And he King. writes books that are kind of scientifically based, but not <laughs> scientifically baffling. Yeah. Hmm. Believable enough you know, that you could fudge it somehow. Yeah. I mean, the veracity of the science is open to question, but it's, it's sort of based off scientific ideas and those ideas are conveyed in such a way that you know what he's trying to tell yeah. you. Mm. Okay, so yeah, that is Jurassic Park 1993. Let's get some uh, closing thoughts for this movie. I'm probably going to regret asking this, but Joe, what did you think of this film? <laughs> uh, what did I think of this film? I... Ignoring the fact that I forgot that the computer stuff in this was so bad that it made me want to scream. Well, it actually made me scream um, in not in a good way. Um, I like this film. It, it was longer than I remembered it being. I didn't remember like the whole first section with the lawyer, but it, that wasn't too bad. I'm just going to focus on the image in my head, which is Jeff reclining on the table and leave you all with that final thought. 
And Sammy, final thoughts? Uh, my final thoughts are I still like this movie. I'm really sorry about the computer gubbins, which I totally forgotten about. Because I think the last time I saw this movie was the 90s, and I was still using a dot matrix printer and might have had, like, terrible, you know, sort of extremely slow dial-up internet the last time I saw it. But, um... But no, I think it's great. It's so much fun. And I do think that in terms of sort of space and pacing and, you know, in terms of the, the, the way that the movie is timed, it doesn't feel like it's a long movie. It just feels like it flows really, really well. And it gives you enough space to breathe between scary things happening without giving you too much space. And uh, I just think it's really well balanced in that way. I think the characters are great. I think they did a wonderful job. The, like the kids were fantastic. Um, and they they got, you know, sort of excellent cast for this thing. And um, yes, Jeff is great and he looks fabulous. And I did buy the pop vinyl figure of him in that sort of uh, ridiculous, sexy pose. But, um, uh, but, but yeah, I just... I really think it's a very, very good movie, and I think it holds up very, very well. Fair enough. Uh, Daisy? Uh, I think this film is a test of one's suspension of disbelief. You really have to just go, let's not question anything even vaguely sciencey, computery, mm. and just yep. you have to oh, just yeah. let that wash straight over you. If you can do that... It's a tremendous movie. It it really, I mean, it's a fantastic just the, a concept. Uh, it, actually, let me drop in a fun fact in my final thoughts here. Uh, before the book was actually published, uh, Michael Crichton's agent sent this out to the um, the movie studios, and so it was picked up. Wanted to be picked up by a number of them. Uh, uh, was picked up and pre production started before the book was even published. That's how cool of an idea this whole thing is yeah let's let's get some old dinosaur dna and make a park of dinosaurs and they actually pulled it off in a compelling dramatic way where you're invested in the characters and and it's it's a fun action movie without it feeling like it's just action and nothing else and yeah i loved it i loved it yeah, I mean, my final thoughts is I loved it as well. I love the music. I, I don't know. There's something about that scene where the you see the dinosaur for the first time and the music swells, and it's just yeah. No, I think Aww. it's a really good film. Um, so yeah, no complaints for me. Uh, ignoring the whole computer system stuff, which <laughs> yeah, well, Aww. looking at this from you know a twenty something boy in 1993 i wouldn't have known any different had i been gone with it and been perfect obviously now being somewhat older and being more involved in the computery things um yeah it's frustrating that it's that bad but you have to give it to them uh, there's a lot of things in this film that annoy me a lot of things in this film that make no sense but i don't care because i love the film because i think it's a really really good solid film it's a great story the technology they used for the time was brilliant. It's well acted. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think it's great. I think so. the fact that we can forgive it all of these faults speaks a lot to how much we enjoy the film. Absolutely. And I think you can get away with a lot of, you know, sort of questionable whatever in terms of uh, the realism of things. If it's well done enough, otherwise that it's entertaining and, yeah. and you want to keep watching it it's when something is you know just boring or just badly acted enough that you start picking it apart and it bothers you instead of it just being like okay but but i still love this you know mm. thank you all for listening to us uh thank you to my fellow podcasters thank you joe you're welcome and remember it's a unique system thank you daisy <laughs> I, I know this um <laughs> thank you uh, thank you, Sammy. Thank you. And thank you, Dave. Though I'm thank also you, now sweetheart. wondering whether I should actually ever watch Hackers again because I love that movie, but... <laughs> <laughs> no. I watched oh it God. earlier this year. Uh, it's less irritating than the Jurassic Park computing, but just yeah. as silly. I know. Oh, no. I, I probably should because I really do love that movie, <laughs> yes. but it's just got a similar sort of 
this is not how computers really very, very much work so. yep. yeah. type, type thing so yeah I'll it's not as that. bad as this for that though yeah uh, thank you all for listening and goodbye bye bye, bye. Jeff Goldblum in Rickline hi Joe here before you all go you may have noticed that we didn't mention what film we were going to cover next this is because due to the time-consuming nature of producing the podcast, we have decided to take a short break and go on hiatus. So I'm going to call this the end of season one. Please do stay tuned into that podcast thing because we'll be back in some form or another. Uh, don't you worry. And we'd love to still have you listen. So without further ado to the outro thank you for listening to home movie club part of the that podcasting network visit us at www.thatpodcasting.co.uk where you can find links to all our social media including twitter facebook and our new youtube channel please like and subscribe for news of our future episodes coming soon